The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I would like to invite you to listen Monday through Friday right here on Spaced Out Radio. Three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at SpacedOutRadio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Cosmic Passport. I am your host, Elizabeth Anglin, and it's good to have you along for this trip on this sun Saturday, March 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day. Yes, I am Irish. I am proud. I am an Anglin. We are from Cork a long, 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 long time ago. But it's St. Patrick's weekend. I hope you're wearing green because this is the that's the thing to do. We are coming to you live, not from Ireland, but from the magical mystery abode of Uncle Jimbo's cabin, sharing quantum space with the Pacific Northwest and the Desert Southwest, as it does every weekend here at SpacedOutRadio.com. We are also welcoming in everybody who is listening on WQEE 99, The Rock, out of Noonan, Georgia. Everybody on Spreaker, on the United Public Radio Network, Renegade Talk Radio, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and on Revolution Radio, if you're out there. Thanks to guitar god Ron Bumblefootthal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy, who creates our music for Spaced Out Radio Weekend and allows us to rock in between talk. We love him for that. Also, if you want to check us out on Twitter, you can find us at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like at Spaced Out Radio Show. On Facebook, you can follow me at Cosmic Passport with Elizabeth Anglin. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We're also on Radio Guide FM, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Oh, and if you go to patreon.com, we have some cool offers for you, our listeners there as well. Make sure you check those out. If you want to take part in the show... You can sign into one of our chat rooms on Spreaker or on the chat room on Facebook at SOR Space Travelers Club. If you want to become a space traveler, which I highly suggest for just five bucks a month, you can become one. We offer some decent swag and it is our opportunity to get back to you, the listener. We have a new news section on spacedoutradio.com called The Encounter that deals with everything paranormal courtesy of editors Eric Markham and Everett Themer. And you can check out Dave Scott's blog there as well. If you've had an experience you can't explain, fill out the SOR Sightlines report, and our researcher, Mike Smith, will be ready to find out what's going on with you and help you out. He's a great guy, and I highly suggest talking to him. And no, we're not going to put your private stuff on air. We're all experiencers here. We've all been through this. We've all had weird things happen. You are safe. This is one of the safest places you can be that actually broadcast all over the place. But we'll be quiet if you want us to be. Tonight, speaking of talking versus not talking, I am so happy to welcome in our guest, Trisha Carr, or Trisha Carr Charm, um, who is coming to us from Burbank, California. She is an animal communicator and a spirit medium. She is a prophet for Gaia, which I love. Hey, this earth, this earth woman slash low entropy system needs a prophet and also a protector and facilitator for very highly sensitive people. 
which we have a lot of here. Tricia, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. Yeah, but, um, I am so happy to talk to you. We've got animal stuff going on around here. I'm not supposed to talk about my animals in my gallery here, but, but you can hear them walking around, and every once in a while the cat will get up, and, and, and everybody in the chat room will say, Cat! <laughs> And they'll be like, is that a dog shaking? And it's like, yeah, it's a dog sh- It's Wyatt. Wyatt is shaking. And, and then we'll say, don't talk about it on air. Okay, we're not talking about the animals on air. But literally, I, there's, I can't get away from them because we have a big open space. So. Well, they, they probably they, they want to be on air, too. They want to help. They want to connect. I know my, my cats always do. They, every time... I'm doing some kind of a video or something. They're always, they get in the shot. They actually get in the shot, knock the camera over, or they just, they sometimes sit next to the camera and I think they think they're in the shot, even though they're not. (laughs) (laughs) They always have to be a part of it though. (laughs) Yeah. This, 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 this video brought to you by (laughs) whatever your cat's name are. That's it. You know what? I actually do have a famous cat. One of my cats, um, he has 11 million views on YouTube. What did he do? (laughs) He did something that we named the video Best Kitty Hug Ever. Um, He he does the thing where he stands all the way up and puts his arms in the air asking you to pick him up. So it's really fascinating to people, I think. Well, first of all, I I guess apparently cats are even way more popular on YouTube than dogs because everyone knows that dogs can do cool things and cats are reluctant to. (laughs) Yeah. If cats do, cats are just like, yeah, right. No, I'm not doing that. Yeah. (laughs) Silly human. I just, I talked to a horse yesterday. I was doing a video shoot with a horse and, and it was for a Spanish documentary and I was reading for the horse and I, and I started to do the initial reading and he said, who are these foolish people? And I went, (laughs) 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 okay. And he was an older horse, you know, he'd been around the block a few times and it was kind of like. Who are these foolish people? Yeah, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, never mind. So um, I guess we should talk about you for a little bit. You're in Burbank, but you're from Fort Worth, which you told mm-hmm. me. Yes, how yes. did you how did you become an animal communicator? Well, you know, the story starts the same as I'm sure it did for you. Of course, I spoke with animals when I was a child. I remember that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a medium as well, like you. And um, I had imaginary friends in quote, unquote, in parentheses, in quotation marks. Uh, they're actually two of my imaginary friends. Actually, three, I should say, um, are my guides to this day. <laughs> and um, but, yeah, so far as animals, um that gift opened up or reopened, well, totally consciously and me understanding it to the full conscious level, it really only opened up about two, two and a half years ago. And um, that was after learning about myself that I'm an empath. Um, and it just sort of really, the coaching that I was receiving in order to become a, a much more sh- uh, strong, healthy, sensitive person kind of opened up, well, definitely opened up my third eye and all of my, um, my higher chakras gave me a meditation practice. And then it just started boom happening. And I have, you know, cool evidential stories that happened that I, I wasn't expecting Uh anything and, um, you know, life-saving stuff happened with, uh, you know, from my, my first communication, um, experiences and, you know, consciously speaking. And then of course that, you know, looking back, there are all the things where it's like, Oh, that's why I understood that. Oh, that's why that happened. And that's why that happened. Okay, yeah. so it, it it basically was a point of recognition um, as you were doing your other work for yourself. Exactly, so- just some, per- and you know, I, I I had been the the story goes back to where I mean, for I had I was in this period of my life. You know, I, I started in evangelical Christianity when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I took myself to church. My it was kind of my rebellion. My family didn't take me to church. I raised myself in the church, which is mm-hmm. adorable. <laughs> but I, you know, the the religious part of it stopped working for me. So in my twenties, I left the church and um, was really managing myself sort of pragmatically, uh, is what I thought at least, but although people always still called me mystical, which I didn't, I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, I'm, I'm like so pragmatic is what I thought. But it really did, what I, how I was managing myself then was helping me to just 
um, manage my emotions, sort of manage all of that sacral energy that we have when you are a very empathic person. Mm -hmm. And just being able to not be as reactive from my emotional body. And so I, when I, I did it, like I say, I did that in my twenties and then, and then in my, my thirties. So that was probably about a decade of that, but I don't know, there was probably still some Christianity mixed in there, that kind of a spirituality. And then mm-hmm. I started discovering Dr. Wayne Dyer and Eckhart Tolle and mm-hmm. Deepak Chopra, you know, and that really started opening up my awareness. And, um, and then, you know, flash forward to what is now two, two and a half years ago, I was, there was a couple of incidents that preempted it. One being my best friend's mother-in-law passed away and her mother-in-law was really like her mother. And, uh, she actually, she didn't tell me about it at first because she was so, you know, traumatized. It took her a a few weeks to tell me, but I knew it and I was uh, grieving with her and, I was shocked when she told me because I knew and I was shocked by that aware. I even just looked at the email of talking to her about it. Um, And then a month after that, I had realized that I had been waking up every morning and having thoughts that weren't even my own, but not in a, not in a way where I even thought that I was crazy or anything like that, because I would wake up with this feeling kind of articulate it for myself and be like, well, that's just not true about me. Something like I hate my job, which I don't, I loved my job, you know, I love my job. Right. So, I uh, going through some, I was thinking that's not good for me and that's not good for my body. I had never once had a psychic reading before. I just never even, well, you know, when I was being pragmatic uh, as skeptics are, it's kind of like, oh, I'm not going to be fooled by that. That's silly. And, and even before that, it was like, you know, in, in the church and in religious sectors, they warn you and they frighten you and say you're weak and you're going to be, you know, all kinds of bad things and it's evil. But here I was, and I was like, I'm just going to do it for fun. Maybe she'll tell me something that's just a little story. And I booked a 15-minute reading, and when she said the word empath and explained to me what it meant, it was cathartic. And I just, that was really my big metaphysical opening, that moment. I didn't know what any of it meant, but I, I can just, like, I could see it now, my, my whole being just cracked open. And then there I was, I was ready <laughs> to start becoming more healthy as a sensitive person. And then after that, you know, that's, that's how the, um, the gifts opened up once, one by one. And it started with the animal communication, which is, you know, at, at being very empathic and being telepathic, whether with animals or other people or being a medium, it's all reading subtle vibrational language or being articulate and in it. So I see them all as quite related. It's just, you know, having different talent, I guess, emphasis. Yeah, it's, it's what you want to emphasize on. As yeah. you- as you go along, it will, I mean, 25 years later, as you go along, what will happen is, is it will, it will unfold and, and us oldies will tell you it'll unfold even more, but it is all the same thing. It's just, where yeah. are you, where are you going to put your, em- where, you know, which syllable will you put the emphasis on? Yes. And, and then after a while, you'll find that, um, Everything, you know, whatever is important to the individual at the time Mm -hmm. is where the, this, you know, the emphasis goes. Um, Because I found it's about unlocking, you know, people come for healing, but they come for healing based on different events. Yes, definitely. And you don't know what event is going to trigger someone to really look for spiritual healing or growth or understanding. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it'll be whatever it is at the time. So, okay, I have a question for you. So in yes. my case, what was the first animal communication that you had? Did the animal talk to you or did you have to try? Um, well, the, the big evidential one that is just after all of that stuff I just described. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it literally the day that it happened, I was having um, a phone consultation or a Skype consultation with my my coach, she was coaching me to become a, well, uh, I'll give her a plug. Her website is the happy sensitive because she's amazing. And her little tagline is to go from suffering sponge to sensitive savant. And so I was in like later in that program of hers and we discovered that we were going through the chakras and kind of like digging something out and, um, buried in my sacral chakra, 
I, I, without going too deep into the story, we found that animal communication gift. And she's like, that's it. That's, that's, this is what we're supposed to discover today. And I had started the phone call out with this, with the event, like you said, the event that brought me to this phone call and needing the healing and needing the restoration. The event was I have a feral cat, a couple of feral cats at the time I had three, I think that I cared for a little small colony. And um, I was telling her about it at the beginning of the call because her name is Helen, this, this cat that I care for. And she was pregnant, quite pregnant. And I wasn't sure if I should intervene, you know, it's just a strange area. My husband was leaning toward, we shouldn't intervene. Like, I don't know. Like, he's like, I I don't know if I'm supposed to make that decision for another animal. And I have, you know, this woman who's a, a rescuer and a cat rescuer on the other hand saying, you have no idea how difficult it is for them. And there's a good chance she could die and all this kind of stuff. And so I was in the middle, like not knowing, of course, as an empathic person, I didn't know where I was in it. (laughs) Right. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't feel my own feelings. I was still like (laughs) trying to figure that out. So after this phone call, my coach said, you need to go out there and talk to Helen and talk to her about what, you know, what needs to happen, what the options are. And so I was like, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. Whatever. But I went and I just sat, you know, she was just, she was on the porch. I mean, she didn't need to be, but she was sitting on my porch because she is usually there. And I sat inside and I, I was really open after having this long, you know, chakra clearing thing anyway. So third eye a spin in, I'm sure. And I just took a breath and I closed my eyes and I said, you know, Helen, um, you know, in my mind, I just like kind of reached out to her, you know, like we do. And she immediately said, and I could, I mean, I reached out to her, but I felt and heard her voice. And I mean, not like voices in my head. I don't know how many listeners understand the process very well. But um, yeah, I, I, I un- it's like imagination, but imagination that's coming in rather than imagination that I'm creating is what it kind of feels like. Would you agree? Is that language? Yeah, <laughs> it's, well, what it is, it's like something takes over the voice in your head. And, yes, there you go. And, yeah. and says it in their own way. So it's, and you it's, feel the texture is totally different. Exactly. And it's coming in from the outside Mm-hmm. And it is set in a, in a very particular way with a particular energy and a, a, a particular emphasis mm-hmm. that is not your own. It's like, wait, that's not me. Right. So yeah. that's what happened. And I heard her say, well, by the way, what she said was, I can't have these babies. And again, it's like everything, you know, even like the speed and just the texture of the energy is totally different. And I didn't doubt it the second that this was happening. And she was saying, I can't have these babies. I can't have these babies. And so I, you know, I went through everything and I said, well, look, this is, these are the options. I'm going to trap you in a, in a cage. I'm going to take you to a a vet. And I was giving her pictures of what it would feel like. And, you know, they're going to put you to sleep. You're going to be sore. And, you know, tried to explain everything to her. Mm -hmm. And I had another cat that I had um, gotten, I had trapped, spayed and released. So, you know, I referred to her as Marisol was this cat's name. I was like, but you can live the rest of your life like Marisol. You don't have to have babies anymore and you don't have to go through all of that. And so Helen said to me, all right, I can't have these babies. That was the language I kept hearing. I can't have these babies. I don't want to go to the hospital. I do want to live like Marisol. And I was like, well, the hospital thing's non-negotiable because if you have those babies (laughs) at some point, I'm still going to trap you and take you to get you fixed. You know what I mean? Like that's, and, and, you know, anyway, that's not the, that's the one piece that doesn't make sense with your other two requests. So, (laughs) um, so I did trap her and it was like the next day, I think. And I honestly, I've been trying to trap her for a year or more and she wouldn't trap. She trapped within 30 minutes. We took her to the vet and, um, they told me that one of the babies was lodged inside of her. And so she was, going to not be able to have the babies and she would have died if she had been left out there. So she couldn't have those babies, as she said. Wow. So you got validation right away on your yes. first go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That and was, that, you know, like you said, the event that brought me to it and it all just worked out. <laughs> right. And you got vet validation. That's very similar to my story. Because oh. I got I got vet validation. Well, the vet's dog talked to me. It was the first mm. from after childhood. It was the first actual, just like what you said, the voice in the head. And it was I had learned Reiki, and the vet's dog said, "My I was I was working for a very famous equine surgeon, and mm. I had learned Reiki for myself, 
and the, I had to take care of the dogs and the mules and the llamas at lunch while the vet went to the racetrack. And I was feeding everybody, and this dog, Wags, who was old, and he was a very furry collie, was saying, my rump, my rump, put your hands on my rump. <laughs> Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> I know. And so I put my hands on Wax's rump and on all this Reiki started flowing into his butt. And I'm oh. I was just like, okay, you really need some attention for your rump. I get it. I see it. And I had to go back to the office. I was the office manager. And I went back to the office. And, and when the vet called in, he said, how are my animals? You know, was everybody okay? And I said, well, everybody's okay. But Wags seems to really want some attention for his rump. He was like, how do you know that? I said, I just do. <laughs> yeah, you know? like, I, I don't know. <laughs> he was barking at me and looking at his rump and wanting me to put, you know, wanting me yeah, to put my hands on his rump. Not, he said, my rump, my rump. And so, so the vet goes home and after being at the racetrack and he calls me in the morning at 830 and he says, you're going to have to move my first two appointments back and it's your fault. And I went, oh, shit, what did I do at the house? Oh, I just swore. Oh, oh, I, so I, went, I, went, I went, oh, what did I do? And and he said, Wags is rump. Oh, and wow. He, he had been up all night because Wags had a skin infection he didn't know about, and he had maggots growing out of his flesh <gasps> and his skin. Oh, sweet baby. But, he, but it, it worked out, right? It worked out. No, it was perfect. It worked out perfectly. Wags got Wags got taken care of. I got the immediate validation for the immediate. You're talking to me. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And I wasn't. And and it's like, well, then you know because it's like somebody's right there. It's like, Bing, bam, boom. Yeah. Okay. This is what I'm supposed to do. Um, so it's great that happened to you. It's isn't it cool? Anybody, if you think you're supposed to be an animal communicator, look for that. Yes. But you might have something different, but you'll get validation. Yeah. And it's interesting because your story and my story have a lot of similar elements in that you were doing something else energetic, you know, you were, you were healing in a different way. So you were just wide open and therefore, yeah, the other thing could flow. I mean, I just happened to be wide open. I was working on myself, but it, that, that's the same thing as working on every, yeah. anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Working. I was just trying to heal myself. It was I've been sick for a while. So, um, well, given that, let's see Let's see if anybody wants to call in. We have animals here. Of course, we have these spaced out radio animals. Um, James has a dog. I have a dog people have heard, which we don't talk about, and a kitty cat. Um, <laughs> and you're also an animal spirit medium. Is that correct? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to try to connect with Oreo? She's my kitty that just passed. Oh, sure. I did see a black and white kitty. So that must be Oreo, right? That is Oreo. Mm -hmm. And then, but the kitty who's there is not, you have another kitty. I saw two cats flash in front of me. So what is the name of the the kitty that's living? Bella. Bella. Does Bella have brown or orange in her coat? She's brown. She's gray brown. Gray brown. Okay. Um, okay, so then, I mean, yeah, they, I think they both flashed uh, when you were talking about them. So, well, actually, uh, there's another kitty in spirit who's orange. Oh, oh okay. His name is Simba. Okay, well, I think that I saw Bella, though, because it was, uh, sometimes I can't really tell if it's brown or, or orange, but um, it's not, it wasn't the bright orange. It was, um, I think maybe it was Bella. So okay. Oreo, and Oreo is... Is Oreo is not a tux, not, not a tuxedo, a classic tuxedo pattern. Is that right? She's like an orca. Yeah. She's oh, okay. A, yeah. Yeah. She's white on the bottom, black on top. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So she is, the first thing she's saying is that, um, if she was, she's like, I knew you're going to, I knew you're going to talk about me today. Cause I, I started, started to connect with her. And, you know, sometimes when we're doing this, I'm like, Oh shoot, I forgot to ask permission. She's like, no, 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 I already knew. Um, it's fine. And she says that she does work with you a lot. And she says, but she already knows that. Um, so you, you feel her, she does actually work with you and she's already started to work with you. Is it ha- she passed? How long has it been? Two, three months? No, only a couple, two or three weeks. Oh, is that all? Well, she's yeah. already, she's already gone through the whole She's already been, in, in, you know, working with you. Um, yeah. Have you been feeling that? Well, what what I noticed when she left was that she was a, she was already bringing white light into the house, mm-hmm. and then when she left, all of a sudden, it, 
I, I realized that when she was gone, that she was going to all the corners. Mm. And she would be in a place, and she would hold the light there, and then she'd go to another one, and she'd hold the light there. And she, sl- she slept a lot. So I knew that, you know, for her, the astral plane wasn't difficult because she was always in the astral plane. Yeah. Um, but so she had already been working with me holding energy in mm-hmm. in the space that I work in, and she used to greet everybody who came into the shop. Oh, and, sweetheart. And she would check out every person, and every person had to give her a little pet on the head, and she would basically, as long as she said they were okay, then they could be in the shop and they could look at things. And there were times when she would just look at somebody and go, no, not you. And that person <laughs> would walk out. <gasps> Amazing. Well, I was getting the feeling, as you as you described it, she was saying, like, like she was giving them almost, it's like an initiation, but an adjustment. She would give them like an attunement to come in. But yeah, so that makes, if she sent people away or they sent themselves away, they just weren't aligned with the, and then they were, it was impossible for her to attune them. Yeah. So it yeah. didn't happen a lot, but it was amazing how I knew she was doing something because she would go to every single person. Mm, wow. Was, that's really great. Yeah. So yeah, what's she doing? She, so she's still working? Is she still... Yeah, she's working. It doesn't feel like she, I mean, I'm sure you uh, experienced this. Uh, I mean, animals, their, their, uh, their time healing on the other side tends to be much shorter than human, you know, very generally speaking. And hers was very, very short. It was almost like, yeah, yeah, she went through her <laughs> review and her healing. Like to, it wasn't, and it makes a lot of sense that you say that she was already doing like basically I mean, she was in the astral plane and she was already doing a lot of soul work. So I think she, it's basically like during that time when she was napping, um, mm-hmm. you know, she was, she was doing some of the work that we do on the other side when, you know, when we do leave the body, but she was already doing a lot of that work. And so that makes a lot of sense that it didn't take her that long to actually adjust back into spirit. And, um, but she, she's with, she's like really excited to be able to stay, uh, and help you with your work. She likes to sit on your, over your right shoulder and watch it, watch you over your right shoulder. And she's showing me going away and getting something. So do you work with lost animals uh, occasionally? I do work with lost animals occasionally. Yes. Yeah. So she, if you want to, if you when those come across or if you want to do more of that or however it works for you, um, she's, ha- she can help you with that. She wants to help you with that. I see her walking away and then coming back. And then she's also just telling me this is this walking away and coming back is just her being able to gather resources for you when you're doing the work. Okay. Um, she's showing me also gathering like ideas and information. Does this, is this making some kind of specific sense to you? Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, it makes sense because, um, like, I've been seeing some things that I want to add to the practice, um, Mm. like, in terms of mentoring and tutoring, which I haven't offered a lot of that in the past because um, I've I've really had to think the person was committed. Like, somebody would have to come to me and say, yes, I'm Mm. really committed. But I've also found that if I put it out there and say, I only want committed people, they'll show up, you know. and just the way that Oreo would greet and attune the people that came into the shop, she can help you with those people that you're calling out to. Okay. She'll greet and attune them as well, or they'll just walk away. And so that's a really great, that's a great practice you guys already had established. And so she'll keep doing that for you. And you could just like relax into, into that because you guys already have that practice established. So you could just have faith that when they do show up, if they stay, well, Oreo's already approved of them. <laughs> right. You came in, you wanted this, you're Oreo approved. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. But she, her walking away and coming back is her, like, she's, she is doing this to, uh, it's bringing information, but I think it is bringing those people and bringing the matches. But it's more about um, the bringing of information is her going to um other helpers, high, high order light beings, angels, and other guides, and, and just kind of being like your right hand. And then she can go to them and say, Hey, um, you know, come over here now. Like basically she's going to help to gather the energy that you need, whether it's from, you know, literal people on, on earth or some help from guides and then literally bring you the information. Like she's even saying like, no, I can take the information and then go find it like in the, in the archives (laughs) of heaven and bring it to her. So, um, 
Yeah, that's what she she wants to help you with. Let me see. Um, so she's talking about. Um, I'm, she's just showing me you petting her head, and it feels like when she was that it's it's oh it must be Reiki that you said you're Reiki. So were you giving her Reiki toward the end? Because I see yeah. your hand over her head and light, and yeah. um, so she's honoring that. And did was that hap- you were with her as she passed, and you were giving her light? Yeah, yes. yeah. So that was um, that felt really. I mean, that was so beautiful. It was um the moment is. Um, I mean, the moment she's showing me is just so I'm, I'm hearing, I'm feeling like baptism. I'm feeling that it was such a powerful, it's, um, uh, event of, of the soul for both of you. And it really is just so transcendent and above space and time. Um, and almost like if, if the rest of everything that you did during this incarnation that she's having, if none of that happened, that this moment is like this huge jewel that you two shared that really just changed the whole, you know, obviously universe just changed everything. And of course changed you forever. So that was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with me, sweetheart. Um, and I know, you know, that um, she was able to manage her physical discomfort at the end because she just left the body or she just dismissed it. So um, she didn't need to feel that she didn't need to go through that. You know, some, some of us humans and animals want to experience that. And she just, she didn't need to, she's experienced it. She's very, very old soul. Isn't she? Yes. She's, she's uh, was 21 when she passed. Oh my goodness. And so so an old (laughs) besides old soul actually literally old and she didn't look old until the week that you know all her organs started to fail but before that nobody would have been able to tell how old she was because you know it it, she was impeccable you know her her fur was perfect she was beautiful you know everything about her was was just impeccable and um I, i just beautiful you know, that's all you can can say. I'm so, so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry. She was a good. She was a good one. Well, she got mad at me once because I almost left her in Boston when I moved out west, and she was like, "You can't do that." Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it was like, of course I will drive in the car with you, and when I because I was going to have to take a three day trip in the car with a cat, and I was like, I don't know if she'll like it. She was yeah. like. I will be fine. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'll make so, it. I'll make it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and it will all be okay. And and she was fine. You know, big, long trip. She was absolutely perfect. So, so you, you've been open to your gift of animal communication the whole time that you were with Oreo? Yes. Yes. I, I knew I was, I had been an animal communicator for six years before I got her and I saw okay. her before I got her. I knew I was getting a girl, a black and white, long haired. <laughs> And um, the week that I finally figured out that she was ready, she'd been going to the Petco no-kill event. She was at a no-kill shelter, and they would go to the Petco. And I saw her online the week before, but I didn't have a chance to get to the event. I got to the event the next week, and she had been scratching everybody who came to get her. And when I got there, she went, meow, like, where have you been? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and all the girls at the Petco were like, well, she's not very friendly. She's kind of psycho. She's been scratching everybody, and she doesn't like anybody. And I said, that won't be an issue. Yeah. And I went, and I picked her up, and and she was, then she was fine. And then I put her in the box, and, and, and they were like, she didn't scratch you. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So. Because she was waiting for you. She's like, don't touch me. We don't belong together. Yeah, get away <laughs> from me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm psycho kitty from hell. So, she's a good girl. Well, now I just have Bella. I've been wondering if Bella's been looking for Oreo. Oh, okay. So, um, Bella is so Bella is brown is, and brown gray. Is she um, a tabby kind of pattern? Or, or is she tortie? She's a tabby. Yeah, okay. she's a tabby. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got her. Um, is her eyes are a lighter green? Yes. Yeah. Oh, she's so sweet. She's sweet and gentle, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. She's very sweet. 
Um, she says no. Uh, she says she she only felt her. I mean, she was very sad, um, and you know, she was like, I didn't I didn't really remember what it would feel like, you know, when when it changes that way, when, you know, the, they're gone physically, she did not, you know, we always kind of forget, I think, of course, I mean, I'm sure you don't, <laughs> we can never yeah. remember what it feels like. So she's just mentioning that, but she said she was only, she really only felt her absent for, it feels like two and a half days or something like that. And, um, and actually Oreo saying, but I wasn't actually even gone for that long, but, but Bella was grieving still. So did she visibly grieve? Could you, was she, um, napping and, and that kind of thing for she- a couple of days? She napped and then she would run around meowing. Oh, sweetheart. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that was her adjusting physically and actually just uh, like um, lamenting. Um, she she said so when she yeah. So when she woke up from the nap, she would kind of forget and she would feel the change. And then, yeah, that's why she was doing that. And then, so when she remembered or kind of just couldn't feel her, there was a bit of a panic. And then. And then it was just, it turned into just like basically crying. And yeah. how many days did that go on? Because um, I'm feeling like there was this, that two or three days, but then the, there was a period after that where she still, it started to wean off, but then it was, and that was still, a lot of that was grieving, just crying. Yeah, that's, that was over a week. It was, mm-hmm. it got, I mean, the first few days it was really intense. Intense, you know, yeah. Panic, it, you could hear the panic. And then it was, um, that it became sort of like at a certain time of night, she'd get up and run around and meow and, mm-hmm. and nobody was answering her. And so I'd say, Bella, I'm here. Oh, you know. sweetheart. Okay. Was she, she's showing me licking um, Oreo's head. Was that something she was doing at the end? Because I see yeah. Oreo. Yeah. Um, did it was so, and Oreo showed me you giving her Reiki on her head. Did she have a, a like a um, tumor or, or something like that? Is, is there something going on with the brain that started? This? Now, I, well, she had always, she started to be a little bit daft, but she had a tooth infection, oh. and um, so it, it just seemed like the easiest place to give her Reiki was around her head. Mm, okay. Oh, that yeah. So maybe that's what. And and Bella was just joining you in that. Um, so let's see. She's showing me. She uh, she's showing me kind of spooning around your belly and your sacral area. And she likes to balance your energy there. Um, but she says she's feeling better about, she's feeling a lot better about Oreo. She says she's still sad because it's different, but she is kind of getting used to, she's starting to get used to how the, how it's different. Um, and, you know, Bella, I mean, excuse me, Oreo is, is talking with her and she likes the way it feels. She likes the way it feels as Oreo is kind of like the guide and almost like the, you know, like the very maternal kind of caretaker mm-hmm. from the other side. And so she is appreciating that, but she's still kind of, I don't want to say stubborn, but she's still a little bit like, um, I'm still not like stoked about this. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. still sad, but I mean, yeah. um, and you, ha- so the doggy is your doggy like a, um, um, He's a shorter kind of guy. He's a smaller guy. No, that's not my dog. <laughs> I don't know who that would be, but um, I had a. Um, tell me what you're seeing. I'm seeing a, a, a kind of a terrier kind of guy. Um, not a Jack. Um, I don't know what kind of terrier that's called. The the, the it's like a not a tiny tiny one either. A more medium guy, and he has the um, hair that's a little bit like medium long, not like really short, like a Jack Russell Terrier. I'm sorry, that's, I don't know all dogs that. Okay, oh, so okay. that's that's far in the past. So let him talk oh, because Okay. Yeah, but but that may not be far in the past, so keep going. Okay. So yeah, he and you know, he's got um so his his, his he looks like he's um salt and pepper kind of, not not quite black, but you know, he's got that kind of maybe a little bit brown, like that kind of color. Um but Bella mentioned him, so I think so he's someone who's passed. Well, we think he would, that would be, a, we think Wyatt, my dog now is a Tibetan Mastiff who's quite large, mm. but, but black with, with, uh, we think he is actually Peanut, who was my dog <gasps> when I was a kid, who oh. looked more like a large terrier, but he was actually a beagle mix of something. Well, this may, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's very interesting. Okay. So let me just see. I mean that. I, I, I'm, I, now you've suggested it, so I'm thinking that's what it is because 
that's it. I did, I couldn't tell. I can usually you can usually tell if an animal is on the other side or not. It's kind of yeah. not that hard to tell. So he's not um, on the other side. He's 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 here house. again, but he's yeah. showing. I think this is what's going on because um, Bella presented his energy, and that's the that's the form that I saw. So maybe he is wanting to um, confirm that for you that okay. he is peanut for you. If that's he's- the yeah, yeah he, he's always done. The first thing he said to me when I met him, I was his pet sitter. He, he just looked at me and he said, I'm your dog. <laughs> and, and you, you were and I, That's so funny. And I, and I was, and, the, and then a year later, his owner said, do you want him? Oh, he's your dog. <laughs> Here, take him. Oh, my so, goodness. That's I amazing. Was like, okay. I guess so. He said he was my dog. So it's like, okay, I'll take him. All right. Yeah. Oh, we had some people. We had Michael on on the chat room who wanted to ask a question about his cats. I know he didn't write it in all caps, but I'm not sure if he's going to call in. Michael, if you want us to talk to your tabbies, you can either write in the chat or call in. And James... Uh, he's he's typing yes. something. Mm-hmm. You have Kirby. What's up with Kirby? Oh, Kirby's fine. Well, I don't know. He's just he's around. He's in the other room right now, so he wouldn't attack me. Oh, uh, at this end of the cabin, mm-hmm. usually you can hear his his claws that always need clipping, skiffing <laughs> down the wooden floor of the old log cabin. And we had a cat named Souffle who passed. <laughs> That's cute. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and it was more well, my wife's cat. Uh, used to sleep at her feet, and Kirby sleeps at my feet. Well, actually, takes up most of the bed. He's about 120 pounds and rather long. But mm. uh, how are they doing? Um, okay, so uh, Kirby, let, let me focus on one. So Kirby is, I'm seeing short. Uh, he, oh, you would just, you, did you say his breed already? Did you say it was a. Or no. was I'm thinking of Elizabeth's dog. No. Um, and so I normally work off of photos. So um, oh, forgive okay. me if I like to um, if I like to try to just identify to make sure I'm dialing into the right energy. Or I might pick up his uh, previous incarnation. You never know. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's what we just did with Elizabeth. Um, with Peanut. Okay, so Kirby. Um, so, but Kirby is, you said he's 120 pounds. And I'm seeing, oh gosh, I wish I knew dog breeds very better than I do. Um, he's not a full, he's, he doesn't seem like he's a full breed though. He seems like he, no, is no, he not? no, he's not. He's, no, yeah, um, he's, he's got like, he's, has he got some dark brown or black, but it's very short hair. It's not very short, but or, he's I mean, got fur, dark brown and black. Hair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, and does he have some white on his face? Um, just under his neck, like on the bottom okay. of like his throat. Okay. And I'm feeling somewhere in the middle age. Is he around seven, eight, something like that? He'll be six in July. Okay. Um, any issue with the, I'm feeling something with the, the back, with the right hip. Is that something you've noticed? Sometimes that gets a little achy. Yeah. Because he had, um, he's had a challenge with his rear right leg, mm, which okay. may affect his hip because of yeah, uh, throwing his gait off. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It's centered in the hip right now, um, and it just in. Uh, you're in Canada, you said. So yeah, when I it gets st- chilly, yeah. it aches. Yeah, it, it, when it gets chilly, he, it aches a little bit. Um, yep. He wouldn't mind a, something warm to lie on when it gets chilly, so he could lie on that side and um, help that hip just to you know you know how it feels good when we have a, a joint ache. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's see what else. He says, yeah. Sometimes when it's cold, it, it actually kind of. It kind of smarts, but, um, you know, and then in the, and then when it gets warm again, he feels pretty good. And then, then he likes to run so much that he'll kind of, he'll get it a little bit sore from activity. Yes. Um, what, else, what else is going on with your buddy? And I sent um, you a picture of him on Skype, oh. so you could probably oh, okay. scroll down and see him. Yeah, I heard that come in. Um... Anyway, so let me, I'll stay connected with him. Oh, there he is. Oh, look at that guy. Oh, that puppy. <laughs> so cute. He's 120 pounds. He doesn't look like it in this photo. Yeah, oh, does he, he have was, shepherd in him? He was slimmer then. 
okay. after he got his knee surgery, he gained some weight. And we're trying to get him to come down. Uh, oh, I see. So, um, and so it, it looks like, does he have shepherd in him? Is that, and then maybe that's why the hip has that because the shepherds have the real problem with the hip dysplasia. Is that the deal? Uh, yeah, his mom was a German shepherd and dad was yeah. whatever jumped the fence. It was uh, we didn't know <laughs> what the dad was. Oh, I see the white spot that I saw. Oh, you know what? I think, um, let me, let me just look into his eyes a little bit more. Oh, he was a sweet boy. So he was starting to tell me about, um, about mama, about, does he, is he buddies with your wife? He was, he just wanted to talk about her a little bit. Um, and what's going on. He's, he's saying, so did she used to get to walk him more than she is lately? Is there something like that? Some kind of activity that she's not, in, not getting to do with him as much lately? Yes. Yeah. Taking yeah. him for long walks. And, the, and they don't get to do that as much? No. Oh, um, yeah. And so he says, that he, I think she, he feels like maybe she feels guilty or she's worried about that. And he wants to say, it's okay. I love mama. Yeah. It's totally fine. Um, and he says, and I understand I probably can't because of my, you know, the hip thing that he showed me in the first place. He wants you to not worry about the hip, though. Um, he says, it, it, they, you know, he made his request, just some some warm pad when it's chilly. That would help him out a lot. Ooh, some massage. Do you get him some massage? I do he Reiki on it. Oh, okay. I saw warm hands on it. Yeah, um, that would be me. So the Reiki, I'm sure he loves, but he had also just like your warm hands on it, like a, even a, a gentle kind of um, manipulation. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is going on, sweetheart? Um, toys. He's wanting to show me. Is he a tennis ball doggy? Because I'm seeing a, gre- a, a tennis ball colored toy <laughs> that he he wants to talk about. But it looks like it might be a bone shaped one or something. Yeah, it's a bone. He if yeah. anybody comes to the house, he picks up a bone and comes. Or he picks up whatever <laughs> toy's close and wants to show yeah. you. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Because I saw him carrying it, but I don't get the feeling that he's a great fetcher. Um, but he likes to he likes to show. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, this is does he play fetch very well? I feel like he's not great at it. He kind of it's not he's not one of those dogs that's retrieving all the time. No, he he had he went through that attitude when he was younger that if I threw the ball, he'd bring it back. I would throw it again, and then finally he would just look at me after I threw it. Yeah, I yeah. Think, <laughs> obviously, you don't yeah. want it. You keep throwing it away. So <laughs> exactly, I'm going to honor your wishes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, he, I mean, he, he feels great. He's real happy. Um, he, yeah, mom needs to not worry about, mama needs to not worry about the walks, um, the, the couple of situations with the hip, you know, he's doing well. I mean, he's in, he's in great spirits. And he says, thank you so much for taking care of my leg. And he says, you explained it to him. You guys explained to him what was going on. And so he wasn't very nervous. I mean, it's ever getting, having that kind of medical stuff is not good yeah. for anyone, but he really understood it and he appreciated that. And, um, so he said, you, you said his birthday is coming up. Are you guys talking to him about his birthday? Because he says apparently something special is supposed to happen on my birthday. So he's expecting a party or a gift. Yeah, he gets a <laughs> gift. He gets a new bone that's stuffed with all sorts of stuff. Kong, yeah. Yeah. That's great. So. Oh, well, he's looking forward to that. But oh. just curious if Souffle mm-hmm. is still hanging around. Okay, Souffle is um, a fair-haired kitty. Is, she, is it a female Yes. Was she female? And is, was she long haired? Uh, yeah, kind of medium to long hair. Okay. Did she? But she had fair. Uh, was she kind of um, white and peachy color or something like that? Uh, white and light gray. Light gray. gray. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, he and I'm, I'm actually uh, Kirby's still talking to me too. Um, he says she comes around. And however, she's kind of tending to some other things right now. I see her doing some work. It's like she's working with another group, another soul group, in addition to you. Because mm-hmm. um, I see her kind of splitting her time. And, and it feels like it's also because she wanted to, she wants to kind of grow. She wants to do this big growth period on the other side. So, um, and it's all, she's saying like, also because you still have Kirby and he's really taking care of you guys. So I check in all the time and, um, and I check in on Kirby. So, um, but she's, she's working on her, she's working on some skills is the way it really comes across. Like she wants to really do some, she, she wants to enhance some skills. And so uh, for the listeners, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, I'm sure you guys discuss this on the show. When we're on the other side, we take classes and we learn yeah. different things and animals do that as well. And there's some kind of skill that she wants to help with almost like she wants to do something that is in, in 
physical healing. So she wants yes. to. Okay. Is that that's that makes sense. sense to you? Yeah. yeah. What does that does that uh, mean? I, I have one more question before you tell you that. Oh yeah, sure. I feel her sometimes at a certain point, a certain area in the house. Can you picture where that area is? It it's was some her spot. kind of a. It's some kind of a. Is it a hallway or a closety kind of place? Is what I'm seeing, and I'm seeing and it, it's some place that's kind of cozy and and there, there's not always a like a light, a lot of light there, but I see like there's a glow, almost like the bathrooms around the corner and the bathroom um, uh, nightlight is on or something. Am I getting this this picture oh, right? No. 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 Okay. Oh. I don't know then. Okay. Where is okay. it that you feel? Sorry. It's, Go ahead. It's a little shelf that's connected to the window where it's padded and you hook them to the windowsill and they jump up and they can just sit in the sun and look out the window. That was her oh, spot. Oh, oh, nice. And yeah, that's what no, I sorry. kind of feel right. her around there. Yeah, she, mm. she, when we got her from the SPCA, she stopped eating and mm. we had to actually have surgery with it, insert a tube that came out of her neck and inject <gasps> the food that way until oh, eventually that's... we could remove the tube and then put it into her mouth. And she wow. fought it for the longest time. And finally, like, er, her organs were shutting down because she wasn't eating. Oh, that's terrible. And so that's how she ended up passing? It just didn't work out? No, no, that worked out fine. But she was just really old. Oh, oh yeah. okay, okay. Oh, she made it through that then? That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, so then she, in this life, she got a lot of um, medicine kind of, a lot of medical experience, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, from, she did. I've, I've yeah. got a... Um, a uh, person in the chat room, um, uh, it's a question about a dog she had when she was, when she was three or four years old, and I want to know if she, she the dog, is still a lot alive, oh. um, and if she knows, I would never give her away, and that I miss her. So she's asking about a dog. Um, Does a dog have a name? Yeah, I'm yeah, trying to. Help. I'm trying to. Re- I'll, t- I'll read exactly okay. what it says. Hi, Teresa. Is my mom? I'm Jamie. I have a question about a dog I had when I was about three or four years old. I want to know if she's still alive and if she knows. I would never give her away, and I was miss her and hope she knows I love her, loved her. So I don't know mm-hmm. if the dog's name was Jamie. Yeah, uh, sure. Is my mom Jamie? Yeah, it's well, it's harder. It's yeah, probably I probably don't have enough details to um connect but I'll, I'll just tell you sweetie you can oh, um, Isabella. reach out to her yourself. Isabella? Okay. Isabella is the dog's name. You can yes. definitely reach out to Isabella and I promise you that she can hear you and she can feel your heart. So she knows I, I, without me connecting with her, I could tell you for 100% Isabella knows that you love her and that our animals are are beyond forgiving and they understand that and they always tell me things worked out the way they were supposed to so just feel uh, try to release that guilt and know that she's always going to be connected to your heart and she doesn't hold any blame or or anything like that i promise you yeah hey i've got a couple more questions maybe one you can do real quick um michael wanted to ask about one of his cats Mm -hmm. uh, monkey he wants to know why does monkey pull his hair out Mm. Um, and is he's in the chat room, Michael? Yes. Is? Mm-hmm. Okay. And okay. Well, I'm seeing that he's pulling it out somehow on the lower uh, side, lower part of his body. I see. I think maybe it's on the inside of his leg and also on the outside of the hip. Um. Um. And it feels like monkey might actually be kind of young. Um. Oh gosh, I wish I could get some validation so I could find out if I'm going in the right. Um. Uh, but I'll just keep going. Let's see. Maybe monkey. Uh, I feel like maybe monkey does have some exposure to something outside, but he's all, it's twofold. Monkey's monkey's either very young or he's got young energy and he's a bit bored and he needs more physical stimulation. He needs to, um, he needs to be able to release some of that energy. Um, and then, but he also is getting, there's something that he's picking up on his, on his fur and it's uh, giving, it's making his skin a little bit itchy, but it's actually, he just doesn't like it on his, on his fur. Excellent. So he's getting, it's some exposure as well as some pers- as some energy. On the Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Trisha, we're mm-hmm. we're getting to the end. We got like a minute, twenty seconds. How can people reach you? Uh, my name is Trisha Carr, and the the website is Trisha Carr Charm because my 
I have a, a radio show and an uh, online talk show called Tr- Charmed Life with Trisha Carr. So trishacarcharm.com, T-R-I-C-I-A-C-A-R-R, and the word charm. Excellent. Give her a call if you want some animal communication. She's also teaching classes. Check out her website, Trisha Carr Charm. And thank you so much for listening tonight and being with us for Animal Communication. Trisha, I'm going to invite you back in a couple months. I hope you I would love that. that. I would love it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I really loved it. All right. Good night, everybody. This is Cosmic Passport signing off. We're going into the rest of Spaced Out Weekend. Hi there. With Jan- this is Dave Scott, and I would like to invite you to listen Monday through Friday right here on Spaced Out Radio. Three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at SpacedOutRadio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Hi there. This is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Spaced Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, News Director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spacedoutradio.com. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to The Reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogle, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to The Reporters. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter the encounter. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Story so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. It's 
time to go live on Spaced Out Weekend. Thirteen, please. Oh, hi, Kevin. Oh, is that the time? Kevin, my friend, don't you find that watch just a little bit loud? Well, I certainly hope our buddy Bumblefoot is playing when we get there. Oh, you stinky big bundle of hair. I said Bumblefoot, not Bigfoot. Oh, it's going to be a long night. It's time to head to the 13th floor of the old log cabin for Spaced Out Weekend with James Tyson. You can tweet James at James Tyson SOR. You can find him on Instagram, Spaced Out Weekend, as well as on Facebook. On YouTube, our channel is Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can check out our website, spacedoutradio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. And now, perched high in his captain's chair, way above the clouds, here's James Tyson. Good evening and welcome, everyone, to Spaced Out Weekend. I am your host, James Tyson, and it is good to have you all along with us. I'd like to thank uh, Elizabeth Angle and Teresa Carr for the animal communication at the in the first hour, uh, which was really cool because she talked to my dog. And we definitely will be having her back. So... Let's relax now and talk about ghosts. I am broadcasting to you from the 13th floor of the Spaced Out Radio Network Little Log Cabin out in the Pacific Northwest, or what we like to call Cascadia, the lower left Canadian coast here in the paranormal portals. And that's we where we're going and staying tonight. We are staying in in Cascadia. I want to thank everybody who's come out and listened to us at WQEE 99 Rock the Key in Noonan, Georgia, and all of the metro Atlanta area at spacedoutradio.com. And if you want to go to a chat room on your own spacedoutradio.com, go up to the little linky button thing on the top left corner, hit listen live, and it'll bounce you into a chat room. We are also on Spreaker on the United Public Radio Network, Renegade Talk Radio, and the High Plains Talk Radio Network. You can also Go say hi to me on Twitter at Spaced Out Weekend. Give my Facebook a like. A, what would that be called? James Tyson? Yeah. Uh, James Tyson Spaced Out Weekend. Or please join us on Spaced Out Radio Show. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune in. And iTunes both have us. It's kind of cool now that we're also on something called Radio Guide FM, Talk Stream Live, and on Stitcher. And, of course, SpaceOutRadio.com. We do broadcast out through the United Public Radio Network to 160 countries around the world. We have a big listenership down in Australia, New Zealand. We are picking up, believe it or not, in the UK and the Netherlands. And we have a couple of listeners in South Africa, and my goodness, I don't know what time it would be there for them. And welcome. We're having a lot of fun here. And tonight on Spaced Out Weekend, one of the big things that I wanted to mention is at the end of the month, I am going down to uh, the Oregon Ghost Conference. That's March 31st, April 2nd in Seaside, Oregon at the Civic and Convention Center. And tonight we have on the person who is responsible for that. So if there's anyone to blame, it's going to be Rocky Smith. Now, Rocky was born and raised in Oregon City, and today he teaches the at the uh, art at the Oregon City High School, where he's been for the last 15 years. He is well-known in the community and a local historian and paranormal investigator. Rocky has just finished his second term on the Okanagan City Commission and is currently taking much-needed break from politics. Oh, I wish we could all do that. In College Rocky worked for three years in the historic, uh, Erm- I want to say this right, Ermatinger House? Ermatinger House. Yeah, that'll work. The oldest house in Oregon City and the third oldest 
house in the state of Oregon. He has many paranormal experiences over the past 20 years and at the Ermentura house, including his first experience, which was there, which featured in Susan Smitten's book, Ghost Stories of Oregon. Rocky has also worked to preserve the historic home, which is in the process of a complete restoration and should be open to the public within a year. Rocky started researching the paranormal activity of Oregon City in 1995 and has documented close to 100 haunted places within the city. In 2006, he combined his love for history and the knowledge of the paranormal, founded, and he founded Northwest Ghost Tours and now leads the Walk with the Spirits tours in Oregon City. Rocky has been featured on local radio and TV and has been asked to speak at several paranormal conferences on the West Coast. And uh, in 2006-2007, he was awarded Teacher of the Year at Oregon City High School. He was also awarded Oregon City Citizens of the Year in 2013 and currently is the director of the quickly growing Oregon Ghost Conference, which is what he unfortunately has invited me to. Uh, so, Rocky, what were you thinking when <laughs> right. you invited me down to that? Welcome to Spaced Out Weekend. How are you? Great. How are you? I am well. I am very, very well. I had a paranormal investigation on Wednesday, which was very cool because we had somebody in Washington State do a remote viewing on it before we got there. So it was the first one I'd ever been to that wasn't like the needle in a haystack where you get some information from a client and you kind of go in and have to wander around looking for something. We knew exactly where to go, who to talk to, and what to talk about. Wow. Where was this at? It just up, uh, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. There was a, a residence up there. It was very, very, very cool. cool. Yeah. So all of a sudden, back, you know, you're working as, you know, taking, taking uh, I guess, a job working for a old house. Is, was this a, was this, was this home part of a, um, a historic tour back then? Or was it, it was something that the, the county owned or the city owned and was trying to get uh, kind of, it, it's, county property or city property and trying to get some tourist business in it? How did you get attached that, to that old house? Well, um, actually, in uh, high school, I started working uh, for a museum here in Oregon City. Um, this is the end of the Oregon Trail, or designated as the end of the Oregon Trail. And um, so I grew up in this town, which has this incredible history, and um, worked in a lot of different historic places. So first at the end of the Oregon Trail Museum, and then um, and the city owns the house. The city owns the, the Ermitinger house, and um, Oregon City was incorporated in back in uh, 1844, and so the house was built just prior to that, about 1843. It's the oldest house in Oregon City. It's actually a Hudson Bay Company house. Um, so there's a lot of connection to Canada and, and the history in, in the Northwest. Um, it's also the house that uh, supposedly the coin toss to name of the city of Portland took place. So it's a really amazing place, a really amazing house, and incredible history. And um, I worked there in high school and college, and um, the house had been moved um, several times. Um, is actually currently in its third location, and um, the house started falling apart towards the late 90s, and um, I've spent probably the last almost 20 years um, trying to save the house, and um, it's finally uh, being finished. So um, it's been, you know, neglected. It was neglected for so long um, by the city, and... Um, there was a lot of reasons that I ran for city council or city um, commission in this town, but one of them was to save this house because it was the oldest house in the city. Wow, that is that is kind of cool. I know that we have Fort Langley up here, and there was a Hudson's, and that was a Hudson's Bay Fort, and one of the first European settlements here, and the other one that we would travel to is at the mouth of the Columbia River. And, right. And, yeah, that would be... Their second fort. Fort Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, Fort Vancouver. Yeah, Fort Vancouver, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So we are well connected. Uh, the Fort Langley is only uh, maybe 45 minutes away from here and haunted as heck. We poke around in there quite often. Um, and it's a federal uh, park. Yeah, it's nice. These are that's a that's a good connection. That goes back to some real hardworking people who actually one of the guys up here took a party down and got wiped out by a uh, some of the American Indians down there. So that was written up on this end. So there was a bit of a I wouldn't say a battle. It was just a uh, it was a disagreement over whose land and why you're walking through this area. It wasn't right. it wasn't right. a uh, like a whole. Uh, tribe of Indians. It was just one clan. Just got a little ticked off with the these white guys cutting through their property all the time and uh, dealt with it. Yeah, that's fascinating. You the 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 coast. This this whole coast. I took my motorcycle down the Oregon coast. Uh, you know, obviously starting in Washington State a couple of years ago, and I'm going to do it again this year. The age of some of these small ports is remarkable and the history that uh, goes along with it. And you forget that it's on our own doorstep. It's fabulous. Right. Right. Well, and, and honestly, that's one of the reasons that I got so involved with um, doing the ghost tours. It wasn't ever originally an interest in ghosts. It was a huge interest in history. And um, working in various haunted places, people constantly wanted to know the stories about the places that they were visiting. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people weren't telling ghost stories or sharing their experiences as much as they do now. And so um, really started trying to connect the history to the experiences that people were having. And that's what created the tours that I do. And it's the tours in Oregon City that grew into um eventually doing this ghost conference okay it do you find it hard putting together a ghost conference in that part of oregon yours i guess would have been the first one wouldn't it um actually no Uh, there was there was several ghost conferences actually um when i probably the reason i uh started planning the oregon ghost conference was Um, I was promoting my ghost tours, and I was going to different conferences. There was um, a conference in the Portland area at one time um, quite a while back, and um, then that kind of moved into another um, small conference that was held up near Mount Hood. And um, they were great events, but they were really small, and in, you know, maybe 10 groups from around Oregon, 10 paranormal groups from around Oregon, and had great speakers and vendors, and so it was a great place to network, but um, it really didn't seem that it was broad enough um, in terms of bringing in the public and making it um, accessible for, you know, all types of people. Um, And so those events didn't last very long, and when they ended... um, just decided to start doing the ghost conference in Oregon city, um, uh, four years in Oregon city, but it outgrew the town. And so, um, had some calls about some possibilities of where we could move the uh, conference. And so last year we moved it to seaside, Oregon, and this will be our second year in seaside and our sixth year, um, doing the conference. Oh, brilliant. Do you find it? It's, um, because you're outside of a major, city you're only about an hour out of portland aren't you does it well um actually seaside's about a two-hour drive it's a two-hour drive okay does that uh, make it a little bit difficult to get um your speakers out or is it uh you know is it close to the oregon city international airport or (laughs) and dry cleaners That, that doesn't exist but um they're about that a little bit. Oregon City is um, a half hour south of Portland, and Seaside is, you know, a two hour drive. So, um, you know, when we started the conference, it definitely did bring a lot of people from the Portland area. Um, and then when we moved the conference, I knew that, you know, that may change a little bit. But everyone still continued to come to the conference, and, and Seaside is a really great um, destination, and it's a, a 
a cool city with um, a lot of history. And um, this year it happens to be on spring break, so that's um, an added bonus. It's, um, you know, a lot of people from the Portland area will be in Seaside anyway. And so the general public that may not even know that the conference is going on can stop by. Um, But we have been, you know, continually bringing speakers and instructors, and we draw people from um, all over. A lot of people come from Washington, a lot of speakers from Washington, California, um, Idaho, and so we're drawing people from all over the West Coast. Well, I I know Seaside, Oregon is a destination for people from this part of Canada, too. It's just a, it's a lovely, quiet little area, and you have a quite a haunted fort there, too, that if the listener doesn't know, this fort was uh, actually shelled by the Japanese in Second World War. And it's, uh, right. yeah, so it was uh, built, was it built around the time of the Civil War to protect the mouth of the Columbia River? Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know the history of that particular uh, place as much. I mean, so you have Fort Vancouver. You're talking about, um, what are you talking about, Fort Stevens? Yeah, Fort Stevens. Yeah. Um, so um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of history, including Fort Stevens and all of Astoria. Astoria, um, not too far away uh, either, and um, a lot of in- incredible history of the underground. Plus, you have you know, amazing shipwreck stories that have happened all along the coast, especially in the mouth of the Columbia. So there's just a a, a wide variety of different, um, you know, history, but also these incredible paranormal stories that are, you know, not only ghost related, but there's a lot of paranormal uh, um, experiences on the coast with UFOs. Um, and um, so it's it's a unique place. Yeah, it, this is a part of the a, a real interesting little. I almost said vortex, but a very interesting um, part of the coast, uh, the area that we call Cascadia, where we live. It's it's rainforest. It is um, you know probably seventy to eighty percent. We'll say seventy percent, almost eighty percent un um, unexplored. You know, you've got a lot of mountains. You've got a lot of rainforest. Uh, the people live along the I five or along the along the coast and on the one hundred one. And in between, there's a few farms and uh, some industry and some homes. But my goodness, uh, the east side of the state and the west side of the state. Some of the west side is still uh, as rough as it was, you know, five six hundred years ago. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place. So if you are going to stick. If you want to uh, see a Bigfoot or a UFO, right. or <laughs> you know, they're all, this is the place. And I was going to ask you about that too. And oh, and then I got a, somebody in the chat room here. Yeah, in in uh, June of 1942, uh, June 21st, Fort Stevens, Oregon, it was shelled by uh, the I-25 right. Japanese submarine, and. Uh, they fooled them because what they did at the fort, they turned all the lights out and didn't return fire. So the Japanese had no idea if they were hitting anything. So it, that attack actually changed the policy in the U.S. Um, land uh, land forces during the Second World War on how they would respond to an attack by a submarine. Because all they had was a couple of very, very old guns out there. Again, this fort was... Uh, built at the turn of the century or as you were just for the um the civil war uh so that's just a in answer to uh our friends in the chat you you coming up with a paranormal and again the history side of things it was it hard to kind of keep it focused on the spirit side the haunted building side without opening it up to ufology and bigfoot and whatever paranormal extreme of the week kind of was going or you you know you're pretty focused on the Oregon ghost conference as opposed to yeah. ghost versus UFO well I when I first started the ghost conference I um, had a conversation with my friend William who helped co-found the conference originally and um, 
we were going over names and ideas for what the conference would be called and, you know, something like, um, at that time we were calling it more specific to Oregon City or uh, we didn't really know Portland or what what it was going to be. But I said, well, we need to say, you know, when you name something, you want to name it big. And um, so we said, oh, well, we'll do all of Oregon. Um, and now, you know, focusing on ghosts, which it always has, um, we have had participation from MUFON in many of the years of the Ghost Conference. We do have um, people that come and, and uh, discuss, you know, other topics other than ghosts. So um, I, you know, semi-regret not calling it, you know, something more broad um, because it is, a, it, it is a paranormal conference that um, addresses a lot of other paranormal experiences besides ghosts. But, um Oh, that's yeah. the name, and once you have a name, you can't really. It's very hard to change it. So yeah, you've branded. <laughs> We're going to keep the name for now. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you've you've kind of branded it, so it's not too bad. And you've been uh, now you've been doing the Northwest Ghost Tours. Um, are, are are you kind of uh, respected? Like, if you said, "Hey, this is a real old building and it's haunted," and I uh, was wanting I could do a tour. Um, I know some areas, it's like the old movie locations down in Hollywood. They get burnt off after a while, and people are just tired of that. Are you finding it a little bit more um, acceptable and a little more wanted down in Oregon City? Um, a little bit. Uh, I guess, you know, part of why I started the tours was a lot of the historic homes and places in the city um, really didn't want to talk about the history, the haunted history. Um, so um, one of the places, which is a national park just a block or two away from the Irma Tanner house, is Dr. John McLaughlin's house. And Dr. John McLaughlin was the chief factor at the Hudson Bay Company. Well, it's a national historic site, national park. Um, part of, actually, the McLaughlin house here in Oregon City is part of Fort Vancouver, even though it's in two different cities. Um, so if you go to national parks throughout the United States, depending on the region, you know, if you go to Gettysburg or something like that, the national parks really um, are open to talking about the ghost stories, but in this region, for some reason, very much not. Um, so the McLaughlin House itself in Oregon City will not talk about ghosts um, even today. Um, and, you know, I think there was, there's was there been a real negative connotation of ghost stories and the paranormal in the past, and so that still kind of exists in some places. But when I started the tours, um, you know, I based that mostly on the history and the knowledge of this city that I've lived in my whole life. And so, um, you know, over the last three or four years, um, people have started telling stories that they probably wouldn't have told in the past. Um, but it's taken a long time to get to that. Um, oh. You need quite a bit, but so people are always sharing stories. And um, But it wasn't easy at the start. I, I totally understand. You know, you, you're going back, um, well, you, you kind of poked your head into this in 1995. Right. You don't want to come out back then and say, hey, I see a ghost. It's... It's re we've kind of come on a bit of a wave in in broadcast media where you had a lot of shows about psychic detectives dealing with spirits right. and then other psychic shows, which then begot the ghost hunting shows, unfortunately, and uh, <laughs> and which some were strictly you know it's funny I know you probably have a picture of a ghost i have a picture of a ghost do you think right. i can ever find one on one of those television shows <laughs> like really you've traveled around the world to the most haunted places you have an entire film crew with you and you can't can't get the picture that my kid got <laughs> at the old school down the road and there's a full apparition, and you could identify him. Like, 
yeah, we've often said, how many pictures of a ghost do we need to prove ghosts exist? Well, we only need one. The problem is having everybody convinced that that picture wasn't doctored and it's a right. real photograph. So it's just crazy. But it did it did take all these all these television shows. Um it did take the the crazy out of paranormal and um the crazy out of uh, psychics who hear voices which has been a good thing and um hopefully it's uh it's going to keep chipping away at that stigma yeah i think so and i think you know events like uh the ghost conference is is doing that as well i think um you know the the ghost conferences that i talked about when i first started were very small and were only attracting just the paranormal groups. They weren't attracting um, anyone really outside that community. And so this event is now doing both. It's building a, a really broad paranormal community in the Northwest and beyond, but it's also bringing in a lot of new people, um, some skeptics, but also some people that have had experience and just didn't have the ability or, or um, interest in talking about it before. So um, it's, you know, it keeps growing every year, and I, I just expect it to continue. Oh, it should. It should. Um, and until the shift happens, and that part of the world all washes away. But uh, <laughs> right. I love driving down Highway 101 on the coast and seeing those signs. Entering tsunami evacuation area, thinking, okay, not today, not today, not today. Yeah, okay, if, you made it through. Driven, if you would have driven through there five years ago, there would be no signs. Yeah, then you wouldn't be scared at all, because there were no tsunamis there. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is the tsunami crossing. How do they know to read the sign? Uh, we've had a number of paranormal investigations in, res in residences and businesses up here, where the mm -hmm. business start first started out saying, yeah, don't tell anybody. Um, right. you know, come in wearing, you know, balaclava in the middle of the night and do your thing <laughs> and leave. And right. now that it was, um, now it's like, oh, could we put this on our menu? <laughs> we have ghosts, exactly. please come. Because they were terrified that they would lose customers. But as yeah. the word got out with the way society is kind of lightening up a lot about this and not that scared of these things and uh you know it's it it is something they can hang their hat on and um yeah. invite people in to their haunted restaurant or their haunted candy shop and have a little placard saying this is what is the activity has been and this is what we think it is so we put that together for them um it's it, it is refreshing because the more people that aren't afraid of this stuff um you know, I, as soon as you drop your fear, you have a lot more questions. Do you find over the last, let's call seven to ten years, the questions are kind of changing a little more? Um, almost, I, I don't don't want to say they're um, smarter questions, but a little more educated on on the type of question they're asking. I'm sure, but I think it, I mean it varies because there's so many different. Um, well, at least in my experience at the the conference, there's so many different people there. But um, you know, the the ability for these groups to collaborate and share information um, is j and and develop partnerships, and that has really impressed me a lot. But we're still getting a lot of newbies that are coming in. You know, so the questions are very varied. Um, but going back to what you were talking about with the the, the business, I think that's been a really huge change too. It's there's still some businesses that don't want to talk about it, but um, we found um, being in Seaside actually, we've got um, the Bridge Tender, which the Bridge Tender Tavern, which is right there in Seaside, early 1900s building, and um, the owners of that building have just been amazing to work with the last year or two, and um, they're so excited about it every year. I get. I get um, emails and, and phone calls through them throughout the year 
Um, and, you know, the owner um, is Katie and Leroy Smith of and, and Seaside. And um, Katie will call me or, or, or send me a message in the middle of the year saying there's a bunch of people, you know, wanting to tour our building. Um, but I told them that they have to talk to you and they have to wait until the ghost conference in the spring. <laughs> so she's, it's just incredible. And, and, and so they really have, have um, become excited about this whole event. But um, I went there when we went there last year, they actually printed T-shirts, and they have T-shirts they're selling um, at the tavern as well um, that are is advertising their story. And, and um, so I definitely have seen that be, um, you know, a, a, a change. But, you know, every once in a while you'll run into a business or you'll talk to people, and they'll, they'll still be pretty cautious about it. Yeah. And we we find out for some of it, like, well, Fort Langley, one of the bigger um, government-run uh, forts, if we go in there, we don't really announce ourselves. We don't... Uh, right. The, and, and like any other paranormal investigation, the evidence we get belongs to the, the client. So we've got an agreement whether we're going to release that or not. And right. it, it's, you know, at some of the places are... Yeah, you can release the pictures, you can release the audio, just don't tell anybody where it is. And uh, Okay. Well, yeah, we'll I remember that. I remember that exact those exact conversations and then then your your the paranormal groups would have to come up with some, you know, secret code name for whatever place they were at so that no when they were talking about it, no one would know know exactly where it was. Oh yeah. And a lot of the paranormal groups around here don't like us because the Canadian paranormal uh, team, we, we actually go clean all the ghosts out. Uh, the ones that want oh, to. Right. <laughs> the right. ones that want to leave, anyway. The, we ask right. if they want to leave, and if they do, then off they go. So we'll find really haunted places and everybody in a lineup to come in and talk to the ghosts, and they get there and there's nobody there. So. <laughs> right. Well, we we all joke about that too because there's definitely a lot of right different groups do, that do different things and and um, but we always kind of laugh about those like don't don't do that. We, what are we gonna you know? Yeah. What are we gonna talk about or what experiences are they gonna have? But for me, you know, even if the ghosts go um, to wherever they're going, um, it the stories are still there and it's it's. Yeah. it's goes back to the history it's like okay this this experience was happening in this place because something happened here a hundred years ago and um just because the spirit moved on doesn't mean that that story is less valuable um and i think you know it's for me it's a storytelling thing and and it's a history thing um you know i still definitely enjoy investigating haunted places and i i love to do it but I don't want that as a job. I don't want, um, I'm not the kind of person that's really interested in writing reports or sitting through, you know, hundreds of hours of video, but, um, you know, I would do it on the weekend and do, you know, so it's the tours and the ghost conference that I've found to be my, um, enjoyment instead of really, you know, the going through all the, um, Oh, yes. All the, (laughs) all the sound and all that. And I still enjoy doing that. But that's not something that I want to do all the time. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get it on our website, so we will go out, get the raw audio, post it in little right. snippets, and have you know one or two hundred people that are we'll call them um, associate members come in and listen to it, like people who might be homebound someplace in the southeastern U.S. can who's interested in paranormal, open it up and go, oh. I, I can hear this and then submit it mm-hmm. uh, because my gosh, you know, you've got three or four tape recorders going for two or three hours along with video with audio right. on it. And some of those silly little ghost box that they'll, they'll deafen you in the first 30 seconds. And <laughs> yeah, you're right. You just, uh, you know, to, to go through those second by second by second, it's uh little daunting if you have a real life and children who continue to want to be fed little weasels uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of people there's a lot of people that do and they absolutely love that yeah um you know so that's that's that, i think it's such a cool you know i've 
in doing this event for six years, it's it's there's certain things that have really surprised me about it. But um, you know, one of the things that's just amazing is the different types of people, all all different types, all different interests that are you know some interested in in actually going through all the evidence. Some people just out for the weekend wanting to go on a tour to hear some cool stories. Um, you know, so it's a wide variety. And, um, you know, I knew those kind of interactions were going to happen, but what has really surprised me, I think, is people coming up and saying to me things like, you know, I met this person two years ago at the Ghost Conference and it changed my life. Um, You know, those were the kind of reactions that I wasn't expecting, um, that, you know, when people start meeting each other and start collaborating, that it really does change, um, you know, whether they're talking to a psychic or whether they've met their best friend or whatever, but it's really been um, this um, community has been built that I really didn't see, um, you know, five years ago, I really didn't see this happening. Yeah. As, and and I've seen it um, on this side from doing this, this radio program, with Dave Scott, uh, we do it seven days a week, and people, ever since we started about three years ago, are coming out saying, "You know, I would never talk about this out loud. Um, right. This, I thought I was crazy, or you know, I've been seeing things since I was as far as I can remember, and now you've introduced me to people who have also seen the same thing, so I'm comfortable right. in not knowing it, and it, it's enlightening for them." And well, and we've seen this with you know you kind of mentioned this. We've seen this with kids that come to the ghost conference that are. I do. Um, me and Aaron Collins. Um, Aaron Collins is, uh, has a um, Paranormal Crossing, a, a, a public access show here in the Portland area. Um, so the last couple of years, me and him have taught a kids class, and we get kids at the ghost conference from you know, three, they're like 10 years old, and it's absolutely amazing. And um, they are saying things, you know, I think one day someone came up and they had a pair of, um, um, they had a certain kind of equipment, I can't remember, but the kids knew everything. They knew all of the stuff. They knew what we were talking about. They had no, um, you know, shyness about sharing it. Their parents were there. Um, and a kind of learning. It's a, it was almost like the kids knew more than the parents did about it. <laughs> oh, wow. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Now, Aaron, um, if I got the right guy, he was born in Tennessee. Is that the fella? Do you know where he was from? I don't originally? know where he was born. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, Maybe I'll have to check out his file. <laughs> I, think, I think he's got hair like me, which is was... Yeah, you know, it fell out years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think he was part of the Northwest Paranormal Investigative Team. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yep. I know who you mean. I think I met him. Um, I met him at a conference once too. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's a uh, he's pretty switched on when it comes to this stuff. And uh, yeah, he, he's uh, you know he's pretty good. And he'll be at the um, Oregon Ghost Conference, correct? Oh yeah, he'll be he'll be there. He's gonna we're gonna be teaching class. He's gonna be um, leading some of the investigations. Um, he's actually teaching a couple classes too about uh, filmmaking classes. So um, yeah, he'll definitely be there all weekend. Ah, excellent. And uh, oh, I forgot to mention this: your ghost Northwest Ghost Walking Tours is. Uh, if anyone wants to go to the website, it's N W ghosttours.com that's nw ghosttours.com and if you're in that um, central coast area of Oregon um, keep that in mind Oregon City and the ghost tours uh, which is something I'm going to try to get in I'm also going to try to get in while I'm down there the um, the Shanghai Tunnel Tour in Portland have you ever been on that one? Absolutely yeah I have yeah, that sounds interesting. That sounds uh, like something that I'd uh, want to poke around in uh, and not bring it's anything home with me. 
if you're you know if you're someone that's interested in history and the paranormal, it's it's a it's a good place to go. I think sometimes people are surprised by it because um, Portland, unlike um, some of the other cities that still have a quite a bit of an underground, Portland has lost a lot of it, mm-hmm. and um, there is. Um, you know, only a limited amount of places that you can really get into. And, and I think some people are, you know, sometimes a little disappointed because you're going into just some basements, really. And, yeah. you know, a lot of the tunnels connecting the buildings are, are gone because of, um, you know, light rail going through or whatever construction or it, in actually Oregon City actually had a, a, a small underground as well. But with the flooding um, with Portland and and Lake City, it's like Oregon City, right on the river. That you know, a lot of the tunnels were filled in because it, it was just causing problems when the river came up. Um, but it's you know, the history is incredible. The history is still debatable. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people in Portland. You know, there's this kind of interesting um, debate about you know, is the Shanghai Tunnel story is true? Um, but the history, you know, of the underground existed um, to what level it did and what it was used for um, is still up for debate a little bit sometimes. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful story. Um, do you want to you want to pass it on to our listener who might not be familiar with the Shanghai Tunnel and what that that um, the the um, stated um, use of these well, tunnels were. In, in Portland, um, you know, the story is that the, the underground um, was a, a place to um, basically take people out to the river on boats. Um, so, you know, someone might stumble into a bar and have a, have a drink or two, and, and um, especially if they came in alone by themselves and weren't attached to anybody, that if they were, you know, not too careful, they might just um, fall through a um, trap door in the floor and find themselves, um, you know, um, taken out to a ship and, and turned into a um, ship. Yeah. So there's a lot of stories about that, too. I mean, when you talk about, um, you know, other undergrounds like um, Seattle or Pendleton or even Oregon City, that, you know, there was a lot of different uses for some of those tunnels in, in Oregon City. Um, there was a lot of Chinese laborers and actually that was um, true for Portland as well. Um, And there was a lot of people trying to get the Chinese laborers out of this area because they were taking jobs. And so um, there's some stories about the um, Chinese laborers in Oregon city actually, um, because they were getting hired at the mill site that um, one night they were just all rounded up and, taken through the tunnels out onto the river onto a boat and and, and we're taken to Portland from here but oh okay so it's it's you know a lot of dark a lot of dark history in fact the actual once they um, were you know sent to Portland a lot of these Chinese laborers the entire um, what is Chinatown currently in Portland is a rebuilt Chinatown because the original Chinatown was burned to the ground yeah they, of As, course, never found out how it burned to the ground or what caused it, but <laughs> every, yeah, rapid oxidation, I think that's what it's right. called, and <laughs> that's how it burnt down. It's, it, it is, well, you know, if you look back, a lot of those towns burnt down back in the day. A lot right. of, uh, so, whether it was, you know, the Chinatown or the main town, it was just, right. you know, somebody drops so a lantern and off it goes. Well, Seaside had the same problem. So, so on the ghost tours, we talk about um, the fire in Seaside. There was a huge fire in Seaside in, in 1912 that burnt most of the town down. Um, so right along the, the Mechanicum River, um, most all of the buildings in that early part of uh, history um, in Seaside were burnt. And, and they didn't have enough water power to fight the fire, so it just completely leveled the city and and um alexander gilbert who was the mayor of seaside in 1912 actually um built a lot of the new buildings that are there in seaside so in the actual downtown seaside you have the gilbert district which is you know a block of um cement buildings that he built 
replacing the wood buildings that were burnt in the fire. Yeah. That's fascinating. The stuff that, and as you know, there's a lot of times things that were in one building and the building is gone and you build a new building on right. top, but that, that thing is Doesn't still there. Much. <laughs> no. Right. Uh, I always remember right. the story about a um, couple of policemen in the Midwest. They pulled into a ma- like a corner store in the middle of the night, pulled in the parking lot, and they both looked up and they saw a woman um, floating in midair in a rocking chair, just an apparition. And she would have been on the second floor of whatever building used to be on that parking lot. Right. And that, that would be wow. probably her, her residual energy from years of rocking in that chair. I'm going to say residual and energy, but who knows? It could have been grandma very happily sitting there <laughs> looking out the window that doesn't exist anymore on the floor that doesn't exist. And these two policemen are looking at it <laughs> like, what the heck is right. that? Well, I, I love I love this topic because you have to, you have a connection to the police. Um, my my father is a is a retired police officer. My brother in law is a police officer. Um, so most of my family are either school teachers or police officers. And um, I think one of the interesting stories that, as a kid, really um, maybe set some of this ghost stuff in 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 my head was. Um, a story that my dad told, which um, within a block or two from where my dad grew up was a little, you know, little grocery store, a little kind of neighborhood market. And um, as an old, so as a kid, they would walk to that market all the time, get snacks and stuff. But um, when my dad became a police officer in, the, in Oregon City, um, they would constantly get calls to this little market and um, because the owners actually lived in the in an apartment in the back part of the store, and um, they would hear things at night, and they would um, call the police because they'd hear things falling off the shelf, things like that. Well, my dad and his partner went to this little market, and um, you know, I hear these stories. I heard these stories growing up from all the police officers when we go up in the mountains camping, and they would tell these stories. Well. My um, dad's partner, you know, went white when they started talking about this store because the other police officers were kind of joking about it. But the um, my dad's partner, who had gone into that building, saw a, what he said was a loaf of bread floating through the store. And he never went back there. Even when the police were called to the store, he wouldn't go. And for years, I would hear this story and, and hear um, my dad and some of the other officers, because it's a very serious job, about, you know, this is a crazy thing, and they would kind of make fun of him about this story. Um, and um, today, that market is gone, and they've built five townhouses there, which every time I drive by, they're, they're for sale, or one of them's for sale, or there's a <laughs> lot of turnover there. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an incredible, um, thing to know that those things continue on and, um, people have these experiences for decades and, and other generations, but, um, you'll be interested in knowing too, we have an author, um, an Oregon author who's also, um, going to be at the conference and I'm kind of really excited to have him there. Um, and he has a book. And um, his book is basically all about um, police officers and, and um, emergency personnel and, and their paranormal stories. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I think um, that's going to be a really cool addition. His name is um, Lauren Christensen. Yes. And his book is um, Cops, True Stories of the Paranormal. Yep. Um, ghost, you know, go, go. So this is, it's broader, it's ghosts. Um, UFOs and other um, shivers. Nice. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I think that's going to be cool. Do you, you say you have some um, teachers and police in your family. How many nurses yes. and artists do you have? <laughs> well, I'm an art teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's several artists in my family. My sister works at the local hospital. So, yeah. so um, she, works in the, she works in the ER. So yeah, you've so got... Those, that pretty much summarizes my whole family, all those 
those jobs, yeah. Yeah, and those are all empath jobs. Those are jobs um, where we are drawn to uh, teaching, nursing, policing, are helping jobs. Right, right. And you could start off as being, you know, a, a, an accountant and think that's what you want to do, but all of a sudden you experience something and you, you know, or you do a ride along with the police or you end up uh, being a bartender at a guy's wedding and you think, you know, dealing with people are, it makes me feel so much better or creating something that makes someone <laughs> smile. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it does. Yeah. But, um, now we're, we're in finals week at school and sometimes I wonder if that's true. <laughs> yeah. But you've been teaching for so long. Just think back. Um, you think right, this right. is what I do as a policeman. I think back at all the lives that I've touched sometimes of the, at the time was perceived to be a negative interaction. But, right. you know, 20 Absolutely. years later, you look back and go, no, that we were the bumpers on the little kid's bowling lane where right. the guy was going to the gutter and you bumped him back into the lane. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like going, he wanted to go to the gutter, but... You know, that wasn't his path at that time. And the same thing as a teacher. Yeah. You right. you do your True. best to be the bumper on that lane, on the, the gutter. Did yeah, you ever... You run, into, you run into run into them, you know, 10, 15 years later, and and they actually get to thank you or, or share that story, which you, you know, sometimes are surprised by. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, we see... You know, we only see them in a little bit of a window in their lives. Yeah, and, right. um, you know, that, you know, hopefully we don't walk away thinking that that's who they're going to be forever. And I learned that as a policeman that um, people change monthly, yearly, and in decades, they could be a completely different person, um, yeah. depending, on, depending on their environment and uh, what they bumped into. So, have you seen, when you were a little kid, prior to all this, did you ever see shadows and things? You know, I, I don't remember uh, as a little kid ever really having those kind of experiences. And um, I, you know, kind of sh- laugh about this, actually. But, you know, I, would, I, I have a sister who's um, just a little bit younger than me. And, um, you know, we'd grow up, and when we're growing up, why? that time it was like unsolved mysteries and stuff like that. And um, my sister would flip out. She couldn't, she couldn't handle it at all. And so I loved watching those kinds of shows. Um, and of course, you know, hearing stories, I was always interested in, um, you know, always obsessed with Halloween and, and um, um, doing haunted houses and that kind of thing. So I had an interest. I just never really was, um, never found myself being able to have these experiences where I was opening up to it until I started working in some of these haunted places. And, and what was interesting in, in high school, around high school, college, I had multiple different jobs in a very short time. And everyone at each of those jobs or through other people, I would start finding out that almost every place that I was working had these ghost stories connected to it. And um, when I started working at the Irma Tanger House is when I really started having my own experiences. And then definitely as I started doing the tours, things would happen, um, you know, almost um, predictable sometimes because I would be so, it would be so routine with the tours that I would take a group and I would know that certain things were going to happen. Um, so, you know, I, I still... Um, I have a lot of friends that are psychics, and I, I know that I have some abilities, but mm-hmm. I, I have a very hard time um, balancing, you know, trying to keep an open mind and bring some of this stuff in, but also um, what I don't like doing on a tour is I don't like having any experience and, and then trying to tell everybody about it because people that are paying for a tour if you start telling them that you're having this experience and, that, and they're not having it it, it yeah. just appears to be fake and i yep. so i tend to not i tend to not say much um and so i kind of try to watch things that are happening um and if other people mention it then i will i will share that but um i try to be careful with that but it, it's a struggle 
And sometimes I feel like I'm blocking it out. Sometimes I'm not. And so at the end of the night, I might have this massive headache because I've been dealing with all this stuff, but not really um, letting it in. So I think, you know, as the years have gone by, I've been able to um, do a little bit better with that. But I still... um, still have the skeptic part of me too <laughs> yeah and that's going <laughs> to stick that's around good. i think that's good yeah. yes keep the skeptic part going um well, ladies and gentlemen I, we're going to come I, back with more oh. from rocky smith and talk about the oregon Hi ghost there. conference this is dave scott and i would like to invite you to listen monday through friday right here on spaced out radio Three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at spacedoutradio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Spaced Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter online only at spacedoutradio.com. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to the reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogel, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. 
The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to the reporters. Hey everybody, this is Patrick Webster Small and I'm here to bring you the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night, live at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. If you're looking for aliens and extraterrestrials, well, we've got them. Big and tall, short and small, you're bound to find what you're looking for. So join me on the Webster Phenomena, right here on Space Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Revealer Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r or my Facebook page, Rivulet r and to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. It's time for you to make time for you. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box, the iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Tonight's edition of Spaced Out Weekend is brought to you by SpacedOutRadio.com, where you can now sign up to become a Space Traveler member. Now... For the final time tonight, here's Spaced Out Weekend's James Tyson. Welcome back, everybody, to Spaced Out Weekend. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I want to tell you a little bit more about Spaced Out Radio and the the things that we are up to. Well, Dave is up to. Dave Scott does the Monday to Friday I, in fact, only do the weekends because he doesn't trust me with the keys to my own little log cabin here. But if you want to take part in the show, you can sign into one of our chat rooms. You can go to Facebook at the SOR Travelers Club or Space Travelers Club and um, go to spacedoutradio.com. And again, just click on that little live, uh, listen live, and you'll bounce into that chat room. We do have one on Spreaker. And I'm sure there's a number of other ones. Unfortunately, I don't uh, monitor the Twitter one. Uh, but if you do, want, you are listening and you want to drop by, just go to the website and uh, click on chat or um, listen live and we'll pump it through there. And while you're over there, for $5 a month, just a little bit cheaper than that Ariana Grande with cinnamon twist and frappe whatever, you can become a spaced out radio space traveler. We off, offer some pretty decent swag, and it's our opportunity to give back to you, the listener. And we also have a new section called The Encounter that deals with everything paranormal, courtesy of our editors, Eric Markham and Everett Themer. You can check out Dave Scott's latest blog there as well. And if you had an experience that you can't explain, Fill out a Spaced Out Radio Sight Lines report, and our researcher, Mike Smith, is ready to find out what is going on. And uh, we'll get back to you. And all that information is 100% confidential. Until Dave gives it to me and I accidentally read it on the radio. But that's just what he has to put up with. Uh, <laughs> we are speaking with Rocky Smith. Rocky is the founder, the director, the go-to guy for not only the Ghost West, or sorry, Northwest Ghost Tours, but he is the uh, the hostess with the mostest for the Oregon Ghost Conference, which we are all going to. Well, I am. Uh, March 31st to April 2nd, 2017. That's just a week or so away. It's going to be at Seaside Oregon Civic and Convention Center. Now, if you want to get a ticket, uh, if you're in the area and want to go see what the schedule it is, go to the OregonGhostConference.com website. Again, OregonGhostConference.com website and get the full meal deal there with all the guests, all the happenings. Um, there, there's stuff for everyone. There's from magic shows to to actually um, ghost 
and paranormal investigation, uh, even if if you want, go to the beach, uh, sit around the bonfire, March 31st at 9.30 p.m., going to have a nice uh, bonfire and swap ghost stories. Well, hopefully we're not going to swap them. Uh, mine aren't that scary. I'm going to see if I can get the bejiggers scared out of me. Uh, again, that's the, Gorg- the Oregon Ghost Conference, March 31st, April 2nd, just a couple of weeks away. Rocky, before we left, we were talking about actually empaths and, and things that yeah. some people see and some don't. Uh, off air, you were, happened to be talking to me about uh, your experience. Basically, you you may not see a full-on apparition, but you see shadows. Uh, are they When you say shadows, are they like human body shaped shadows or are they like kind of just a moving mass against the wall or what are they like? Both. Oh, both. both. Um, yeah, actually both. Um, but you know, what I was saying is, I, uh, you know, as an art teacher and as a, as a person that's a very visual person, um, I think partly why I don't see full on apparitions is because I don't think I could actually handle it. Um, and um, when I do the tours, I'll, I'll see, um, you know, maybe someone standing across the street, but it's, it's out of the corner of your eye, and then I'll look again, and, and they're gone. Um, so, you know, most of the time when I see that, you know, probably like a lot of people, we just think, oh, well, I was just seeing something, or it was a shadow that passed by, or something like that. But uh, more often than not, when I'm doing tours, someone will say, oh, did ever, did anyone see that? And um, then I'm more, you know, open to saying, oh, well, yeah, I saw it. Um, William, who is a friend of mine that helped start the ghost conference I was telling you about earlier, he used to do tours with me, and one night I got done with a tour, and I saw, you know, someone standing across the street in the dark, and then looked again, and it was, this person was gone. Um, so walked around the corner to get... Um, I was telling you, I, I sometimes I get really big headache during the tours because I'm blocking things out or or um, experiencing things. So I tend to go and get like a big um, Coke, a big soda or something with caffeine after I'm doing the tours. Well, walked over to the store to get something to drink, and William said to me, did you see something over at the house? And I hadn't told anybody, and... and he says, well, because I think I saw someone standing over by the house. And I said, oh, my gosh, what? And so I just left my soda at the store, and we ran a block, you know, back to where I had ended the tour. And I said, you show me where exactly you saw this person standing. And he pointed to exactly where I had seen that. So those kind of things happen. Um, one of the things, though, that I, you know, I'm trying to open up to a little bit more is this, um, you know, psychic ability that I think most people have, um, you know, differing, um, at differing levels. Um, when I was, um, when my grandfather passed away, I knew a week before he was going to die that he was going to die. And, and, um, you know, so I get these dreams occasionally where things happen and I know that that's going to happen. Um, but I still am skeptic enough about it that I don't call myself a psychic. Um, you know, I, I think that we all kind of have these experiences that we write off to coincidence and, and then later find out they're very much are not. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I appreciate you say you're a bit of a skeptic on this because this is the way I went into the paranormal investigations at the beginning too, until I was seeing and speaking to disembodied people. Well, that and your cop. Well, yeah, uh, this stuff, when I saw, I saw things when I was 16, I was in a bad accident yeah. and uh, saw what I thought was the kid, one of the children in the car that was in the accident wow. walking around with his dad and then found out later that he actually died in the car. So, but I wow. could describe him fully. Yeah. So, you know, look, hindsight, again, being 2020, um, mm-hmm. It, it's it's kind of spooky when you look back at that. So now, and a friend of mine who the first spirit medium that I ever went to, um, as this was awakening and getting switched on more and more within her, she was hospitalized for the first two, I think it was November, both 
both Novembers, um, you know, literally going to the mall to go Christmas shopping and the people that were walking past her were staring at her weird and she realized they weren't alive. Wow. And they were just, they just sucked the energy out of her and she was hospitalized twice um, on an IV completely drained. And now she's kind of moving off grid because she can't even be around um, a lot of the electrical uh, appliances. Like she doesn't have a microwave or anything like that. It's, uh, it's, it's something that it just, it bothers her so much um until well you know i guess she's better at blocking now but before that it was just she was a little glow in the dark um ember and all the spirits were kind of walking yeah. up to her thinking that they could be helped um one of the things i wanted to ask you about in oregon city you have a the willamette falls electric company or uh, portland right. general electric now right. that goes back to the turn of the century and I know right. from out here, uh, with our turn of the century power plants and hydroelectric facilities, those things are haunted as heck. Have you <laughs> had the opportunity to be out there at all? Oh, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, we have a, a mill site in Oregon City that that is actually the, the the there's a mill site on both sides of the river. Across the river is the city of West Lynn. There, they have a mill there that's still in operation. Um, on the Oregon City side of the river, um, our mill was, was shut down five, six years ago. And um, so it's been completely abandoned from that point. Um, being on the city commission, I've been working. Um, oh, I just got off the city commission this last, at the first of the year, after eight years of being on the commission. And um, because the mill, once the mill closed, um, the whole um, ability to reimagine that place. Um, and that place that we're talking about, place of the state, it, it was the birthplace of industry. It was the site of the first long distance electric transmission in the United States, um, as you mentioned with Portland General Electric, which was originally an Oregon City Electric Company. Um, so the history there is just incredible, but the, the, buildings and the mass of this these mill buildings has just hidden the Willamette Falls for for you know the entire history of the city pretty much um, of course obvious in in terms of the pioneer history um, the Native American history though predates that by thousands of years and so you have this amazing site um, which you know, people in the Portland area just don't understand. This is the second largest waterfall by volume, um, second to Niagara in the United States. And um, so that six blocks of downtown, which is abandoned mill, abandoned mill district, um, has a lot of incredible stories because the mill site is actually built on six um, blocks of what was originally the downtown. And so you have these buildings built upon buildings, and sometimes two and three times. Um, and you have sections uh, that you can go underneath the roadway because the roadway was built up because it, near the river. Um, so you have all these abandoned buildings now that are not accessible really to the public unless they have they go on one of the you know tours that are only offered you know, maybe three four times a year. Um, but definitely a lot of stories there, um, and you know we, we're we're working as a city towards redeveloping that whole area, keeping and restoring a, a, what historic buildings are there. But so many of the buildings that are there now are um, basically um, you know metal buildings that housed equipment, and so um, there'll be a mix of historic buildings and new development. Um, but how do you get someone to develop a site that's been um, abandoned and, and polluted for so long? And so, and, and, a, and a site really that no one's seen um, with Willamette Falls. And so the plan is actually to build a river walk that will allow people to get all the way out to the falls where you can actually overlook the falls on PG property. And, um, once people get the ability to go out there, like some of us have been able to, 
um, we think that people will understand the importance of redeveloping the site. So it is actually a major pro- project um, coordinated between uh, the state of Oregon, Clackamas County, and the city, um, and Metro. And um, so it's a huge partnership that's been going on um, for the last five or six years to redesign what this place will be. And I think, you know, it's the questions that I have is what happens when we redevelop this place. It will be an amazing place that gets people back to the history of the city, especially the Native American history that we have kind of neglected even talking about for decades. And, um, but what's going to happen with the paranormal there, too, I think is, is an interesting question. Um, and, you know, maybe in the next five or ten years we'll, we'll be seeing some, some um, activity there. Uh, how, how old does the landfill go back? Like, how, when did that first start? The mill itself? Yeah, sorry, the mill. Um, well, so actually, I mean, you, the, since the, the start of the city, John McLaughlin actually built a mill on the fall site um, probably late 1830s into the 40s. And, okay. and um, Oregon City, um, you know, is incorporated to 1844. So from that point, you get, um, we had a woolen mill there. We had a lumber mill there. What in recent history, they all were paper mills. So the mill district just slowly grew, taking out most of the downtown. And as it did, Um, the commercial district then took out the residential district. And what's Mm -hmm. interesting about that is both of those districts are on the lower part of the city next to the river. Um, The elevator, there's an elevator actually that connects you to the upper part of the city, which is up on the bluff. And that's why a lot of the houses in Oregon city were moved because as the mill site started tearing down some of the city, the the buildings that they thought were valuable to save were actually moved completely to a different part of town. Yeah, and I I understand too. There was uh, back in the eighteen sixties, the after the winter and the runoff, it basically um, wiped out Lynn City on the other side of the river. Yeah, that's right. So, and Oregon City was that's right also badly badly damaged but lynn city was right. gone and if anyone right you know I'm, I'm thinking that whole area and because you've got running water the movement of the water creating energy and you've actually right. got a hydroelectric dam creating a ton right. of energy well you you could really see something like when you're out poking around want to, wanting to talk to a dead person right what a great place to go do it well, we've talked about that, I think, you know, and, and that goes for places like Seaside, too, with the ocean and the river. Um, so in Oregon City, though, you have you have not only the waterfall, the, the Lamb Falls, you have mm-hmm. within a couple blocks, you have another waterfall called um, Singer Falls. You have the convergence of two different rivers. You have the railroad going right through it, railroad tracks, which also springs an energy source. Yeah. Um, so there's all these things, and it's all within, you know, a four or five block area of the downtown, which is, you know, makes this a very, very active place. It, it, that would be incredible. I've been to a place sort of like that. We were at a paranormal conference in Concrete, Washington last year. Um, Eric Cooper and uh, the Force Moon Paranormal put that on. Concrete is, you know, it, it's also a two rivers kind of coming together. Right. There is a hydroelectric facility and it's probably built on quartz. Like it is. Right. We were out for a walk with the mayor right. and he was pointing out all the different places that you, oh yeah, so we call this one this and he lives in this apartment and exists there and what a mm-hmm. what an incredible place to actually see um see not only residual energy but make contact uh, easy contact with those who haven't crossed because they can draw on the on the natural energy to communicate, and right. it was incredible. So again, you've got another city, you've got Oregon City, basically the same kind of thing, and a, yeah, and, like and a said, long history. 
the geology as well. I mean, the, the 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 basalt. We have basalt, so the whole city is built on basalt. And the cliff. There's a hundred foot cliff that divides the downtown to the upper part of the city, which is connected with an elevator. So the the cliff um, has, you know, in early history of the city, confined confined the development to a very small space um, until they could get up that cliff, and so you have the um, reuse of space, the reuse of land, and the moving of buildings, and the moving of even cemeteries, um, moving of graves, um, on top of all that energy, too. So it, it's um, a really, really unique place, and um, if you're ever in this area, let me know, and I'll take you uh, around town. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I definitely have to. I mean, I, I, I do want to spend a little more time I'm probably going to come out a day before the conference. And again, the conference is, uh, starts at, on March 31st, goes to April 3rd. But I'm going to probably come out a day before and even hang out a couple of days after. Because I do want to go up to Fort Stevens. Uh, I do, mm-hmm. um, you know, there, there are, you know, you, you you call it a cliff. I call it a fault line. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. familiar with the Bolton Fault? <laughs> um, <laughs> Which not a little bit, yes. <laughs> stretches from Oregon City to... Um, Through yeah, well, yeah. West Lamin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm thinking, so yeah. So you know a lot about this. You know a lot about this community. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm psychopathic. I can read your mind. Um, <laughs> hey, hold on, that's not right. The... Uh, <laughs> Well, like I, I'm Cascadian. It's one of those things we do. Yeah. We kind of poke around, and I yeah. did have a, a really nice motorcycle trip uh, down that way. And um, I wish I had more time at the when I did take it. I didn't know it was going to be that slow on the road with a uh, mm-hmm. slow speed limit and RVs and bicyclists <laughs> all over the place. Right. I had way too many pubs that I should have stopped at. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, so this summer, if I, if I get a chance, I'm going to come back down. Actually, if the weather's good, um, Rocky, I want to come down there on my bike uh, at the end of the month. So fingers crossed this this yeah. monsoon winter flurries thing gets out of our way. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> that fault thing, it, it reminds me, I played football in against a, a team down Menlo Park. California, and we were all billeted at people's houses, and they looked out, one of the guys I was playing with looked out uh, in the backyard of the house he stayed at, and there was a wall, and he, he looked at it and said, that's kind of weird, that wall's there, and the, the kid who lived there says, it's not a wall, that's the San Andreas Fault, it's just <laughs> six feet higher wow. on the ground on the other side, and he was like, oh, that's that's interesting, I want to be billeted somewhere else. It's probably the safest place around. You know, the wall just either gets bigger or smaller. Not a big <laughs> deal. But, yeah, it's um, any type of uh, ge- uh, geology, like you say, is uh, it all It all kind of comes together in this perfect little paranormal storm. So what a wonderful place yeah. to go poke around. Yeah. I'm going to have to bring uh, the Canadian Paranormal uh, Society down there to... Uh, that would be great. Yeah, as soon as as soon as uh, your dollar gets better, gosh darn it! Or I guess it's our dollar. Your dollar's doing well. <laughs> yeah, our dollar is uh, kind of going for a it, bit of a dive. Yeah. <laughs> so, but like I say, seaside wonderful place to stay. Uh, great place uh, to head down to. Um, kind of wishing the Amtrak stopped there, but eh, you can't have everything, right? But. Uh, <laughs> It's, it, it is the going entire, to be good. Well, that's, it, oh, I was just going to say the yeah. um, the whole history of you know the of seaside is based on the railroad, but of course the railroad's not there any longer. Yeah, that's kind of uh, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia too. the The end right. of the railroad was in a place called New Westminster, which was going to be the capital of British Columbia, and then they moved <laughs> it to Victoria. I thought, well. Geez, I wonder why they did that. But, uh, yeah, railroads, the things that built up the community and disappeared. And uh, things moved on. But uh, it's a great location. You know, you're on a river. Um, 
well, it's Oregon City. You've got, you know, two rivers. You've got uh, access to the ocean. So you've got fish. You've got lo- logging, just like where I grew up. Um, Rocky, can you go over uh, who you have as guests coming on to the Oregon Ghost Conference at the end of the month? Well, we have a lot of, just a ton of speakers. Actually, one of the other things, too, uh, other than speakers, we have um, a huge amount of classes this year, um, which I think is one of the biggest changes um, this year from last year. We've doubled um, the amount of classes that we're going to offer. But um, I think there's a couple of speakers that I'm really, really excited about new for this year, and I told you about uh, Lauren, who's going to be talking about his book about cops and the paranormal. Mm-hmm. Um, Nicole Strickland um, coming up from San Diego again. Um, she's been at our conference the last couple years, and uh, she does a lot of work at Queen Mary in Long Beach. And so I'm excited to see her again. She's going to be talking about uh, children a little bit about as well. Um, and um, let's see, I would like to, um, we have a lot of panels, um, so I want to mention those. Um, we have a panel um, that me and you are going to be on, actually, um, talking about the West Coast and, and some of the haunted places here. I've got um, people from um, Oregon, Washington, California, and Canada on that panel, so I think that'll be a good um, conversation. And... Um, we're doing, we have a, always have an author's panel and a psychic panel. And um, this year we're going to do um, a small panel talking about three uh, local films that have been, um, two films that are in process of being created and one that is finished. Um, my hope is that in the future um, there'll be more of a film connection here at the Oregon Ghost Conference, and that's going to be hopefully next year. Um, I want to kind of launch a little bit of a film festival at the conference. So, um, so there's, you know, every year we try to do something a little bit new, a little bit different and, um, keep it growing as we go. Nice. Now the one you were saying this in production, was that the, is that the, um, uh, permanence, a uh, paranormal case study? Yeah. Well, there's two. So one is all around us, which is, Right. Um, focused on uh, Seth Michael, who is a, a local psychic in Portland area, and actually a lot of psychics um, in this area um, are going to be a part of that film. They started, um, boy, a year or two ago, and um, what I think was supposed to be a one, um, one two-hour documentary is now going to be maybe even three. So they, they've done a lot of filming, and that's in production, and... and um, they're going to be probably filming a little bit at this year's ghost conference. And then the other one is the permanence, which um, this is going to be really exciting. This is a group of um, five really great people that have come together probably through this ghost conference, most likely one of which is um, Jay Verber, who was on uh, ghost mine, um, the TV show. Right. And, um, and so they are actually working with, um, the owner of the Wheeler Hotel, Katie um, Wheeler Hotel, is not too far from Seaside. Um, very amazing historic hotel. And, um, you know, she came across this place and, and um, on a road trip and, and ended up buying it. Um, and she, you know, you know, has had a lot of people interested in finding out the story of this place. And, you know, I think she's been approached by a lot of those paranormal shows that we hear about and, um, you know, all of us have connections to some of these paranormal shows. And, and, and when we find out the direction that they want to take the story, um, we kind of, you know, are a little taken aback by that. I, I think sometimes, you know, when you have a historic building and the story is so rich and the, the, activity is so rich in a place that to make it something that it's not, I, I don't understand that. And so she, I know has turned, had turned away people and even started, you know, questioning whether or not she should, you know, share anything about the place because of the way that people wanted to interpret it as a negative thing. And, and, um, 
So she has, through the Ghost Conference, you know, met all of the five um, that are working on this, and um, and has let them start filming this because she thinks that you know they are going to tell the story in the way that she want, you know, the way that she has experienced it, the way that you know, with the respect that she has for the place, and um, you know, so that's it's a very personal thing, and. You know, when you um, are connected to a place like that, um, it, it becomes part of you, and you want it to be told in, in, in a respectful way, especially, you know, these are people that she's live, she lives with every day. And, um, and, you know, she has been chosen as the person to really be the caretaker of this place, and she feels there was a reason for that. And um, so to, to not tell that in in a way that honors their history, I think, is is something that most of us find to be kind of uh, offensive. Um, mm. it, it's that, um, that's south of Cannon Beach, too, isn't it? It's down further? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But how, how far a drive is that from uh, Seaside? Oh, I'm guessing. I, I think it's a half hour. It's, oh, shoot. It's not very far. You know, yeah, it's not very I, wonder far. If, I, I wonder if they've got any rooms. That would be a good they place might. to stay. They might. Yeah. They actually might. Um, I, I I don't think it's a huge drive, um, but this is something that um, that the permanence. The there's actually you can go online and find it and watch the trailer for it. It's just incredible. This is, um, you know, Jay Verberg, Michael White, Casey Goodwin of Oregon Paranormal, um, Ben Robinson, and Neil McNeil, all of which are. Um, people that have just been an amazing addition to have at the Ghost Conference have been at the Ghost Conference for years, um, have developed a friendship and a partnership that has spurred into these different projects. And, and this is not the only group that that's happened for. Um, so it's it's really neat to see how, you know, some of these projects and, and um, teams continue to go um, year after year after they um, connect at the conference. Yeah. Oh wow. And they don't have any rooms. <sighs> Way to go. They, oh, you just looked it up. <laughs> yeah, I just looked it up. <laughs> and they're booked again. Like you said, it's uh, spring break. It is a destination yeah. area. It's a beautiful little boutique hotel, uh, the old Wheeler Hotel, Highway 101, Wheeler, Oregon. And uh, next time, next time I'm down there. Next little uh, cool trip on my bike. Yeah. That's it, it. Looks beautiful. Uh, going to their website, um, wonderful little place. Uh, Bedandbreakfast dot com USA Wheeler Old Wheeler Hotel. That's uh, that's some place I'm going to check out, especially if it's a little bit active. I know that some of those television shows can, you know, I don't want to mention any of them because it's rude to mention Ghost Adventures. But I know that <laughs> um, yeah, they make stuff up. A friend of mine, David Oman, owns uh, a home in Hollywood, California, that was built next door to the uh, where the Charles Manson um, murders were. Mm-hmm. Very, very active house, and they literally made stuff up, <laughs> like yeah. you know, loosely yeah. based and, you know, on information. It's I, uh, horrible. I don't understand it, you know, and I, I, I know that they have to, you know, it's a ratings thing and all that, but. To me, there's, you know, people that are interested in the paranormal. Um, if it's a good story, if, it, if the history is incredible, and in most of these places it is, and if you can, you know, go into a place where the history is that powerful, um, I don't know why you have to create a story, um, you know, create a fake story. The, these stories are so incredible on their own. Um, you know, I wish there was more shows that really um, focused in on that piece of it. And I think actually that's what's spurring some of these, you know, documentaries and these projects because, um, you know, people are saying, you know, this is not the real thing. This is, this is not why we are involved in this, this, um, you know, this hobby or in this career because, um, you know, there's other things to it than just getting, you know, this horrifying, 
demonic story, you know, although there are those as well. Yeah, I, it, it, there is some really good places out there and a lot of, a lot of decent, you know, um, uh, haunted locations. We'll just call them haunted locations. I can't even think of something else to call them. But what's really irritating is, um, what is really irritating is now that we've actually come out of the shadows to say that we're seeing things in the shadows, we have people come in to make all this crap up. Right. And then it makes us look like we're lying and we go back into the shadows again. So what's the point? What are these people kind of out there, you know, trying to sabotage people who are actually finally coming out? It's it's horrid. Absolutely horrid. I've got a question from Michael in the um in the SOR Space Travelers chat room. What is considered the most haunted building in the Portland area? Hmm. Wow. Thirty um, seconds. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, if you say Portland area, well, this is kind of funny. I mean, there's so many, but um, if you asked uh, Jeff Davis, he would hotel the White Eagle Saloon in Portland. Um, I got a phone call um, earlier in the year um, from Reader's Digest, um, and they wanted to know. They were actually working on an article um, and writing about the top... Um, top five haunted cities in the um, north, well, top five haunted cities in all of the United States. And um, so they had, um, you know, New Orleans and Gettysburg and everything, and they they wanted, to, they called me because they wanted to find out about Portland. And, um, um, you know, because they looked up they looked up um, Portland ghost stories or whatever, and they found information about the Shanghai Tunnel, and they found information from the other haunted places. And then they came across my website, and I said, well, you know, actually, Oregon City is way more haunted than Portland. Hmm. <laughs> and so when the five, when their list came out, it included Oregon City amongst these national, you know, cities um, that everyone knows to be extremely haunted. Um, and, um, you know, because they didn't have a photograph of Oregon City, they put a photograph of Portland. But um, it's kind of funny to go look at it, but they referenced a bunch of the places that I talk about here in Oregon City. And, and you know, Oregon City and Portland are really connected in its history, um, but Oregon City predates Portland by quite a bit. In fact, the city of Portland was named in the house that we were talking about earlier, so... Oh, you're right. They had a. So I couldn't. I said, you know, if you're going to call me asking about the, the most haunted places, I'm not going to direct you to Portland. <laughs> but you know, Portland has an incredible history, and and um, I think some of my favorite places um, in Portland. Let's see. Um, oh, well, definitely White Eagle. Some of the a lot of the McMinimans place at Edgefield which is not, you know, in Portland, but outside of Portland. What's um, that? Um, no, just a, it's a, um, the Edgefield was an old uh, poor farm. And um, so now it's a, the McMinimans have purchased a lot of old schools and a lot of old historic buildings that were there and have turned them into restaurants and hotels. Um, so that's kind of out towards the gorge. Okay. Um. Let's see what else. Uh, you know, some. You know, I, the other thing, uh, separate from haunted places in Portland, I think Portland has the Portland area has some of the most incredible cemeteries, um, and one of the most amazing places I think is um, Lone for a Cemetery, which is right, kind of in uh, on the east side of Portland. Why? Why would you think a ghost would hang out in a cemetery? I don't. I don't necessarily. <laughs> uh, so no, I'm not saying haunted. I just uh, because of my interest in history and oh right, uh, art, yeah. uh, You know the the there's um, you know some of these some of these cemeteries are just and 
you know, the, when you find out and you do the research and, and, you know, who's buried there and what their story is, um, it, it's pretty incredible. I, you know, you also have to be very careful with that because, um, you know, a lot of the cemeteries, um, you know, at some point they, they, they want to definitely stay away from ghost tours really because there's this, that negative connotation that we were talking yeah. about. What, you know, does that bring in an element of people that, um, you know, leads to vandalizing the cemetery, things like that. But mm -hmm. um, at least in a couple places like Lone First Cemetery, they've realized that on certain nights like Halloween, it makes more sense to do a tour and makes more sense to invite people in on a tour and not necessarily a ghost tour, but talking about the the spirits or talking about the the spirit of the people that are there. Um, that way, the cemetery is filled with people that are volunteering to do the tours and the cemetery is protected because there's an event going on where people are watching rather than leaving the cemetery, um, you know, empty it on Friday the 13th or on Halloween night. Yeah. You, open and plus, to vandalism. Yeah, there's me being the policeman side of thing going, hold on, if we right. have public tours and light the place up and have people right. all over the place, you're not going to get some yahoos in there drunk in the dark, knocking tombstones over. Right. over. Right. Um, I've got a question again from Gail in the chat room, uh, space, uh, SOR Space Travelers. What do us, we, ghost investigators, think about shipwrecks? And I can tell you, Gail, that shipwrecks can be haunted if someone died on them. But a lot of the ones on the West Coast... Um, yeah, a lot of people perished on the West Coast. And, and if you go from Alaska to California, I've got a book uh, when I, I started scuba diving. Uh, the It was the shipwrecks of the West Coast. And if you put a dot for every shipwreck, it's just yeah. almost a black line going all the way down the coast. Yeah. It's huge. And a lot of people died, but a lot of people made it to shore. So we have a ship... Um, that is seen every so often on, on cloudy days on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And oh, I think cool. it was three years later, after the ship went down, the lifeboat, one of the lifeboats empty, uh, maybe had a life jacket on it, or a, uh, but it washed up, washed ashore. And it was Very completely empty, wasn't full of water, just like it, it was brand new. And it huh. was in the old Maritime Museum, and it was haunted. Well, the whole museum was haunted, wow. but the uh, and unfortunately shut down because it's got it's full of asbestos and nobody wants to fix it. But brilliant old building, but that ship is supposed to appear every so often. There are a number of ships like that up and down the coast. Yeah, and uh, one at Seaside actually, uh, not uh, right beside Fort Stevens. I think it went down someplace. Oh, was it like 1911 or something? It's washed up on the shore there. It's just basically a metal chunk of freighter or whatever it was. But you know, there's shipwrecks, and then and like and and like Rocky was saying, he was on the um, the Queen Mary. That's a little bit active. Yeah, so, a little bit. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think my dad was on the Queen Bar Queen Mary when he, he left from New York to go to Great Britain during the uh, World War II. Uh, he went over there in the Air Force. Um, Rocky, I know we're running out of time. We've got about 10 minutes, uh, 10, 13 minutes left here. But uh, when it comes to haunted areas, what uh, I know where I find it, what what buildings and what businesses and things that I find are most haunted. But in your experience, when you're out poking around, what are the, the businesses or the type of building do you find more active than others? Well, I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of my connection mostly um, is to home, um, historic houses, um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, businesses, 
definitely have amazing stories, but those are, you know, places that people are there for a certain time, go home at, at, in the evening. Um, and so sometimes if there are things happening in an active place like that, they aren't um, noticeable or that if people don't really um, pay much attention to them because of the business time during the day and, and, and they're not necessarily experiencing things um, because they're not there in the evening. But um, And then, you know, the, the personal connection that I kind of talked about earlier, you know, those of us that have worked in a place that um, you kind of take ownership of the place. You, you, you feel like you're indebted to the place. The, the Irma Tinger house, you know, one of the reasons I spent 20 years of my life trying to save that house is because I made a promise to the spirits in that house that I was going to do it, that, that I, that I was going to take care of that place. And, um, you know, when you live in a place, um, you know, there's definitely a, a, a fingerprint that's left on that place, um, mm-hmm. in, in a different way than, than, than just a business. And, but I think even in most cases where we're talking about businesses being haunted, it's because they were built on top of where a house stood. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, in, in a lot of cases, not always, but, but, um, I just, I think, you know, it's the it the history of it is what really gets me, but it's really that personal connection to, you know, really understanding the lives of these people that lived in these places, and you know, these places were so important to them, or so um, influential in their um, life and their death that they still are there, um, mm-hmm. or there's still some energy that's that's. Um, staying in that place because of it yeah we and one of the or the three that we we usually have was the most haunted are schools theaters and Mm. taverns or hotels and pubs right just because of the positive energy that it that it comes around so they'll those who either don't know they're dead or don't want to cross like the energy and don't like the negative energy, the uh, positive energy or vibrations much higher, and they're attracted to it. As a teacher and a bit of a sensitive, um, <laughs> do you feel much, um, you know, do you see anything or get any, you know, the hair on the back of your neck standing up uh, when you're at school yourself? <laughs> well, thankfully, currently I, I work in a um, fairly new building. Um, so I, I am a graduate of Oregon City High School and, and, um, and, and, you know, I'm an alumni of the high school and I teach there. But, um, so when I was a student, we were at the old, um, Jackson campus in Oregon City and, and then we built a new high school. Um, so the old high school definitely had a lot of stories about it, um, and several other schools in, in, within, you know, even a few blocks of that building have equally incredible stories. But um, one of my first couple weeks working at the high school as a teacher, um, I had to walk kind of down a long hallway to one of the offices. And this is, you know, in the first couple of years as a teacher, you're there like day and night. You, you put in way too much time. And you, you spend a lot of time in your room. And so I would go down the hallway, and, and most of the people in the school you know, had, were gone. I, and, you know, in this particular evening, all the lights were kind of off. Custodians would probably be in different parts of the building. But I was walking down a pretty empty hallway and down to this office, and one of the secretaries was still sitting at her desk. And, you know, I absentmindedly kind of set my keys on the counter as I was talking to her. And then after the conversation was done, I turned around and started walking down the hallway. Well... I heard my name. I heard someone calling my name. And so I turned back around because I hadn't seen anyone in the school other than the secretary. I assumed she was, you know, calling me back to the office. So walked back into the office and um, I saw my keys on the counter where I left them and I grabbed them and I said, thank you. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, thank you for, you know, calling me back to get my keys. And she says, I don't, I didn't say anything. <laughs> and, um, you know, I talked to a couple people later on. And one of my friends who actually worked at the same school 
much earlier um, as a custodian um, mentioned to me that she would hear her name called in that building as well. And I said, okay, show me, you know, where this takes place, where you've heard this happen. And she took me exactly to the right, the hallway that I was in when that happened. So there are definitely stories connected to that particular school at the old um, Jackson campus, Oregon City High School. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, it's nice to get into those older schools. Uh, even some of the newer schools will attract some someone who maybe is passed in the neighborhood and right. they'll drop in. And I find that interesting too. Um, even some houses attract someone past in the neighborhood because they've got a bunch of kids in their house. We dealt with that on Wednesday. We had a grandmother who actually either passed in the house or at a senior's home, but she didn't cross because she likes the children in the home. Oh, cool. So we had to ask her to leave. It's really nice, but this family wants their own family time now. <laughs> right. You have another family. You're over 100 years old. I'm sure there's grandchildren <laughs> or great, great, great grandchildren you can go hang out with. But uh, yeah, she was the, uh, one of the ones we had to coax over. I also actually had to buy, buy her a small bottle of wine. And she wanted <laughs> something fizzy and sweet. Thanks to uh, Skeeter Wellhouse of um, Forest Moon Paranormal. Yeah. Who did the... Uh, who's going to be also at the um, uh, the Oregon Ghost Conference. Skeeter uh, is on, I think she's on here three Sundays a month um, on Spaced Out Weekend. Two of them she does psychic readings. The other one we talk about what could be happening in the future with the shift. And uh, yeah, very, very interesting young woman who did a remote viewing on this place and... Uh, was absolutely fantastic stunning i I was just amazed but uh, identified the lady in the basement described her drew a picture of her the um the uh client described the exact same person who approached him in a dream showed him the picture and he goes yeah that's her how did you do that wow (laughs) well that's i have no idea how that happens (laughs) so and you're going to be sharing a booth, I think, with her. Yes, we are. We are. And maybe, maybe even doing some. Um, are you going to do a show? Or are you going to just interview people? Or I, I am actually doing two broadcasts: um, Saturday cool. and Sunday night. Sun Saturday night, I'm interviewing interviewing one of uh, the United States' tops top uh, psychic investigators. Um, Hired by Natalie Holloway's family, um, you know, it's uh, Marianne oh, wow. Morgan uh, was, uh, you know, a psychic counselor for Nancy Reagan. Uh, just goes on and on, on and on. Been on a lot of shows like Psychic Detective, Psychic Investigator, um, helping reopen cold cases for the FBI and uh, whatever police force gets a hold of her. Incredible, incredible lady. Freaked me out once because she says, yo, would you like to know when and how you're going to die? And no. <laughs> I kind of hesitated and she said, don't worry, it's, it's you know, your, your children are going to outlive you, which is a good thing because they're young. <laughs> right. And I said, no, I, I'm like, uh, d- 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 no, stop. I don't want to know if I'm falling in a tree chipper tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. Right. It's going to be peaceful. Quit it. Quit it, Marianne. No. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Yeah, you're going to die peaceful in the hospital, you know, three days after being, you know, yeah. mutilated oh, by no. a shark or something. But, uh, yeah, no, I don't want to know. Um, but she's going to be on that Saturday night, and then Sunday we're going to have um, our psychic uh, readings. We're going to have our two mediums and a large, so people can awesome. call in and uh, get a psychic reading. And that we also have that tomorrow night. That's uh, tomorrow night here on Spaced Out Weekend. You can call in for a free psychic reading with uh, Joanna, the medium, and a numerology through Paisley Town. Uh, really, really super people. And that's tomorrow night uh, here on the left coast at 10 till midnight, right after Elizabeth Anglin talks to something else that's spooky who comes on before us. Well... Rocky, it is time for Thank me so to push the boat out. 
And um, again, before I let you go, I want to tell, remind everybody what we're talking about here. It's, uh, it is the sixth annual Oregon Ghost Conference in Seaside, Oregon, March 31st to April 3rd. You can go to their website. Uh, OregonGhostConference.com and if you want to do a walking tour uh, please go to Rocky's website NWGhostTours.com again that's NWGhostTours.com for Northwest Ghost Tours and do if you find yourself down in Oregon City, Oregon and it's a beautiful part of the country please come out to the uh, Pacific Northwest out here on Cascadia and uh, putter up and down the coast Gorgeous coastline, absolutely. If you're out here in the winter, and you want to watch a storm. Holy cow! Go down the go down the west coast. Uh, I tell you, people from all over the world come uh, to the oceanside hotels along the coast just to watch those huge storms and the breakers come in. It's if you uh, want to, if you feed on energy. Oh my gosh! Uh, so definitely. Uh, Drop by Oregon City and all the little other places down Highway 101. Beautiful tour. And if you're like me and on a motorcycle uh, or even doing bike tours, brilliant, brilliant. From the Redwoods to the Craggly Rocks and Old Shipwrecks, what a gorgeous uh, part of the world. Again, thanks very much to Rocky Smith, and he is our host of the Oregon Ghost Conference. Thanks very much, Rocky. Forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, it's good. we're going to have to have beer somewhere haunted. That I, I'm okay with that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, like the bridge tender, the bridge yeah. tender is the place. Yeah, we will do that, and we will do it soon. And for all my listener out there, thanks very much. And please drop by and see us in Oregon, and. Uh, throw US dollars at me if I dance nice because it's very expensive for me being a Canadian okay and for everyone listening down in Australia over in Europe I appreciate it thank you very much and for our friends down in the greater Atlanta area and noon in Georgia and everyone else please just keep an open mind alright that's it let's roll Hey, 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 hey! Let's be careful out there. Far over the snow, what are those voices? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Dave's not here! Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspections.